good one. Right? Um, so our first presenter is Jacob Emery from the, from the Indiana University. From, from the Indiana University. Um, Jacob, hello everybody. <laughs> Jacob teaches Slavic and comparative literature at Indiana University. His book, Speculative Kinships, Economy and Family in Russian Modernism, is forthcoming from Northern Illinois University Press. It's quite good. Um, he's done some articles on Krzyzanowski, which is always fun to say, um, medieval numismatics, which is less fun to say, and currency conversions between the land of the living and the land of the dead. Um, that, I have to read that very soon. Um, our forthcoming from Russian Review, Slavic Review, and the Yearbook of Comparative Literature, respectively. He's also working on two long-term projects, a study of clone fiction and a theoretical account of mise en abyme. Um, clone or clone? Uh, clone, clone, as in okay, orphan black chicken. clone. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, okay, Castro clone. Um, okay, good. So, um, his talk today is uh, Broadcasting Psychic Potential, Romantic Aesthetics, and Cybernetic Fiction. So, welcome, Jacob. Uh, thanks, Elliot, and uh, thank all of you for uh, your, your fortitude, I guess, and, uh, in, in lasting through the whole day to the final panel. Um, as you probably gathered, the, uh, the project that I'm going to uh, excerpt something from for you today is uh, the project on clone fiction, um, and uh, I'll spend the first ten minutes or so kind of summarizing the, the categories through which I approach the theme, and then spend the last ten minutes talking about one author in particular, that's Vladimir Savchenko. Uh, so I guess I should begin by, by clearing up uh, a, a, a universal confusion that I encounter when I, when I tell people the, the topic of this project, and that's that when I say uh, something about clones and romantic aesthetics, then they immediately say, oh, you mean uncanny doubles, right? Which is this, this, very, this very sort of reflexive equation that we make. Uh, but it's also, I think, uh, if, if you analyze it a little bit more deeply, it's kind of a dissatisfying equation on a number of levels. And perhaps most obviously because we usually think of the problematic of the double in romantic fiction as having something to do with a problematic of individual psychology, whereas when we talk about clone fiction in science fiction contexts, then we're almost always talking about um, problems of social organization and political organization uh, that, that encompass and organize large numbers of more or less uh, comparable individuals, right? So, um, and then perhaps most importantly, it seems to me that if you look at the practice of those science fiction writers who identify themselves explicitly with a kind of genealogy of romanticism and, and their, their myriad, right? This is an extremely common move for science fiction writers to make. They, they pick up on a couple of other themes that come from romantic aesthetics instead. And it's those themes that I want to lay out uh, for you at the beginning of my talk today. Um, so I guess the, the, the methodology is, is I noted that there, there are some science fiction authors who seem just obsessed with the clone premise, and they keep coming back to it over and over again, and it becomes central to their work even when that work doesn't all unfold in a single science fiction world. And I guess the ones that, uh, that I would say clones are most central to their projects are uh, Sorokin in Russia, uh, I think um, Gene Wolfe and John Varley in, in the United States. Uh, and these are all authors who are very, very self-conscious about literary history and the tradition of aesthetics at the same time as they gravitate towards this clone premise in all of their, in all of their science fiction work. Um, so whenever they were, and they're also totally different from one another, right? Like, like they're all utterly different kind of subsections of, uh, of, of Jack New Future writing. And so I figured that anything that they all have in common with one another can kind of be treated as a, as a heuristic of, uh, of the clone problematic, and um, in particular, the way that they relate to the legacy of romanticism, the, uh, the movement that, I guess, gave us aesthetics and which continues to inform so many of our aesthetic categories. So the, the first thing that they all seem to have in common um, is some notion of the expressive, which is perhaps like the first thing that we think of when we think of romantic aesthetic categories. And uh, if you look back to the, uh, to the romantics themselves, then you get statements like Friedrich Schiller is saying that the purpose of the artist is to understand the unity of his own self and project that unity into the world in order to stabilize the world and stop the chaotic flow of time. Right? Or you've got um, Hegel saying what the artist does when he makes an artwork is to uh, transform his inner self into knowledge for the whole world and for himself. Or, or in Russian variants, you get something like uh, like Ibachishko saying, 
right? So there are, there are all these, uh, and, and you can add a number of aphorisms by other uh, Russian authors that would fit in with this general premise. And that seems to be the first thing that, uh, that contemporary science fiction writers seem to gravitate towards, is, is a notion of the, the, the clone um, as an expression of the inner self of some originary person that's now conceived of as information. So just to, to run through a few examples, then you've got, uh, you've got in, in, in Gene Wolfe a character, and it's a, a text that takes its epigraph from Coleridge and plays itself out through a pastiche of Coleridge. Uh, the, 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 the clone is asked why he bothers making clones of himself, and he says, uh, well, because I want to understand myself, I want to know myself, I want to put myself into the world so that I can analyze it and understand it. Right? Or you've got uh, a, a story by Varley in which um, a clone is an artist whose medium is the pathetic fallacy, and she makes the whole uh, she, she makes weather into a kind of uh, canvas on which she projects her own uh, emotions, and she's called the last romantic in an admiring review, right? Or you think of Sorokin and uh, like in Golubov Sala, especially when you have like every, every image of artistic creation is somehow it's something which is expressed from within the body, right? You've got uh, Anna Akhmatova writing like in her feces on a wall, or you've got like a clone who writes in his own blood, or you know you have someone laying the egg of the Russian poetic tradition. It's always somehow expressed from the interior of the body out into the into the world. So, um, so cloning seems to represent this point at which the the, the inner self of the artist becomes legible as information, um, at least in a figurative scheme, and becomes subject to this perpetual reproduction. Uh, and it's useful here, I think, uh, to look back to the philosopher Nelson Goodman, who wrote a great book called The Languages of Art in the 1950s, and he makes a distinguishment, he makes a, a distinction between, between two kinds of art, one of them he calls allographic, and one of them he calls autographic. And an autographic artwork is the kind of artwork that uh, is given its identity by the unique moment of its creation. So you've got uh, like an artist who creates a painting, and then any imitation of that painting is a copy, a forgery. It's not actually the painting itself. Um, but on the other hand, something like a poem by Pushkin can be reprinted over and over again. Um, and so long as the information in it remains the same, so long as there are no typographic errors or interpolations, then it continues to be identified as that authentic poem throughout all of its iterations. So I think cloning becomes an opportunity for these artists within the romantic tradition, or at least identifying themselves with the categories of romantic aesthetics, becomes an opportunity for them to um, elaborate, uh, I guess, the fear of this digital, digital singularity in which uh, the personality of the artist herself becomes um, an allographic medium, and not, uh, not the ground of the unique instance of the artwork, but actually itself subject to a process of reproduction that takes place outside the control of the artist. So this leads me to the, to the second major aesthetic category of romanticism. We've gotten to this point where we're thinking of uh, art as being grounded in the personality of the artist who makes some kind of imprint upon the medium, upon the material, in order to create the unique instance of the artwork. Uh, and now <coughs> the artist itself becomes legible as information, and that reminds us that romantic aesthetics originally grew up out of a, a context of uh, reacting against new institutions of information. You've got the invention of lithography that makes the mass uh, production of images in unlimited quantities possible in the late 1700s. You've got uh, the rise of a mass print culture, which is happening around the same time. Um, and in fact, uh, what we call the interesting uh, is a category which was devised by Friedrich Schiller in the late 1700s, precisely as a reaction to this mass of, of, of print media which, which surrounds him. And, uh, and, and, and as Schiller elaborates it, uh, I'm sorry, Schlegel, uh, this is Schlegel, uh, as, as Schlegel elaborates it, uh, there's a logic of kind of in-betweenness, interesse means in-between, and when you get a mass of more or less equivalent uh, entities in an iterative sequence, then it forces us to compare them to one another and find those small differences that then become interesting to us. Right? So there's an important sense in which uh, the looking for the interesting 
in aesthetic texts uh, is something that, that comes out of the rise of mass reproduction technologies, uh, and it's something that originates explicitly in Romanticism itself. And, uh, and Sian Gai, in a, in a really wonderful book, has explained how this becomes important to, um, to authors who look to control the aesthetic identity of their works and the kind of autonomy of the aesthetic within a context in which uh, works increasingly appear within uh, sort of museums or uh, the syllabi of university courses, that is within contexts that aren't within the control of the artist herself. So you, if you have something like a series of suprematist canvases or a series of haystacks or in literature something like um, a series of uh, stories on a common theme, then it provides a kind of context for the work uh, in which there's an internal system of comparison that stabilizes the form and the aesthetic identity of the work uh, kind of over and against the historical context or the institutional context in which it finds itself. And I think that if we, if we look at the, the authors that I've mentioned before, we can see uh, that they become actually uh, sometimes desperately eager to, to create uh, aesthetic forms for themselves which are kind of overdetermined, and they become obsessed with the kind of problematic of history and the stability of the aesthetic artifact over the course of historical time. And this happens quite frequently uh, by way of time loops, right? So all of the authors I've mentioned, they write clone texts that take place within time loops that play themselves out over and over again in a kind of circular narrative structure. Uh, there are other ways of, of, of over-determining narratives, but they all find ways of over-determining narratives in order to really kind of, sort of double down on the artistic autonomy of the text and its aesthetic status. But at the same time, uh, they do so often uncannily by aligning themselves with some notion of political domination uh, in the text. So uh, something like Golubaya Sala, uh, which is a, a great example, then you have a kind of pastiche of three different narratives uh, that take place at kind of three different places and times, all related to a common theme, and it plays itself out through a cyclical structure, uh, and, and, and the shadow of kind of Stalinism is lurking over uh, this project of making um, a loop in narrative time that also seems to me to be emblematic of uh, kind of the, the aesthetic auto autonomy of the text. It creates kind of vortex outside of historical time within that formal <laughs> law of the text holds sway and, uh, and it, 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 it makes itself uh, at least symbolically, I think, detached from and theoretically autonomous from the oppressive forces of historical time and political institutions, but only by way of kind of incorporating these, uh, these, these political and, and, and dominating structures into the, into the logic of the text itself, right? So, so it does this uh, often by way of, of some kind of like Stalinist reference in, uh, in more contemporary Soviet science fiction uh, and, and often by some colonial reference in, uh, in Western science fiction. So um, the, the author that I'm, I'm interested in for this particular talk is uh, the Russian science fiction author who is perhaps most open and most clearly and uh, kind of most, most heartbreakingly naively attached to um, romanticism uh, as it's originally formulated, and also at the same time to the idea of um, a, a future of peer information and the kind of perfectibility of humanity through this future of peer information. Uh, and that's Vladimir Savchenko, uh, the engineer, and, uh, and uh, the, the author of a huge number of, of, of science fiction texts, uh, probably the most famous of which is his 1967 novel, Akriti or Self-Discovery. Uh, and I'll, I'll just briefly summarize that uh, as a kind of touchstone for the development that I, that I see in Savchenko's later career, and how he kind of runs up against a, a brick wall with romantic aesthetics. There, there seems to have been something that was still possible for him to think in 1967 that he becomes uh, increasingly uh, not disenchanted with, but which he finds increasingly difficult to formulate in a satisfying way in, in the later fiction from the 80s. So, uh, Akriti Sibya is uh, it's about this 
cybernetic device. It's a, it's a big vat, and you feed information into it, and it, uh, and it creates a human being. Right? And, it, and it's referred to as uh, the art of synthesizing man. And, and it's, it's very explicit in the text, uh, much of which just takes the form of um, elaborate uh, kind of ideological conversations between characters who are often clone versions of one another, kind of bouncing their ideas off one another. Uh, it's explicitly compared to um, uh, a paintbrush, right? He, he says, in, in the old days, uh, people used to, used to daub pathetically with a paintbrush in order to create images of human beings. But now, uh, I've created uh, sort of this perfect aesthetic medium, which is the medium of humanity itself, and we can make uh, this, this, this entirely new human being and it, and it seems to draw directly from kind of the last pages of Trotsky's literature and revolution. You know, he's, he's talking about, and, and maybe we'll grow gills and live under the water, and maybe we'll you know, give up the need for oxygen and go out to colonize outer space. So this, this project of Najib and uh, really seems um, kind of central to the heart of the novel, and, uh, and Sarchenko isn't, isn't giving up on it. You know, he's, he's, he's translating it into this, into this uh, cybernetic technology of the future, uh, thinking of everything as information, and thinking that uh, if that means that information is under human control, and we learn to we learn to understand the world and ourselves perfectly, then we really can create this uh, utopia for ourselves, which is a remaking of our own bodies and our own identities, and also the construction of an ideal future world for ourselves. Um, and then it becomes uh, it becomes in the next. Uh, in a later text that, that, that draws on kind of the same theme, um, a little bit more problematic, and that's, I'm, I'm thinking of the, of the, of the Povis Piraputini, uh, or Mixed Up, which was recently included in, in Ivan's uh, anthology in, the, in, in Russian life. And it has um, much the same principle. The, the human psychology can be extracted from the body in the form of information. And it's said in self-discovery that you can't do it with rabbits. Only human beings can do it because you have to really want it. So you have to have a kind of identity, a stable self-identity that, uh, that can retain its shape over a series of iterations uh, of this informational reproduction process. And uh, in Piriputini, then this becomes uh, kind of a model for, for interplanetary travel. So the, the psyche is extracted from the body and becomes a radio signal, miles and miles long, and it's held together through this magical force of the will, uh, which I think is identified with this sort of genius stamp of the romantic artist that, uh, that puts its imprimatur upon and holds together the aesthetic text. So the, the soul, in effect, becomes detached from the body, gets sent out into space, and then it comes back afterwards. And uh, as, as, uh, as, the, as the soul re-enters the body of the main character, then he, he quotes to himself several lines from Pushkin's uh, Tarok, right? Prestami Yokini Kakson, right? So it's this, the, the, uh, the, the, the scene, like very sort of important touchstone in romantic literature of kind of the, the spirit of genius or inspiration entering the body, and all of a sudden everything is felt differently, it's sensed differently, it's seen differently, it's heard differently comes out differently. Uh, it's the, the transformation of the human being into an artist. But here, instead of being kind of a demonic force from outside that, that visits in the form of inspiration, it's actually the self returning to itself. So it's become a feedback loop of a kind. Uh, and and the, the thing that makes uh, the artistic moment possible appears to be a kind of error in the transmission of the information. The brain has partially liquefied by the time that the soul comes back to it, and so, so the, the main character becomes synesthetic. He, uh, he, he begins to hear light, and he begins to see sounds, and at first he's effectively cut off from the world around him, but he undergoes an aesthetic education of sorts uh, and learns to see the world in a new and perhaps more artistic way. So I guess the first thing to note is that this presumes that all information is perfectly uh, transferable from one medium into another, that light and sound are perfectly commensurable media, and you can just kind of translate one into the other. 
And then the second and sort of weird thing is that it happens when he listens to a romantic poem, right? Being, being, you know, he listens to like a Latricia poem being recited to him, and uh, and and he and he says, oh, and then I saw these shapes when I heard that poem, and I was able to start to see how the sound and the shape mapped onto one another. And then he listens to a bunch of records by Chekhov and Tchaikovsky. So again, it's always these romantic authors. And as he listens to these, and he thinks, oh, you know, it's just like a, it's just like a truly honest painting. Oh, it's like watching a film based on a truly honest painting. Right? So you just get this proliferation of media that somehow are all coming out of this same, uh, this same impulse, which is the, 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 the soul of Tchaikovsky or, or, uh, or Chopin that, uh, that, becomes, that becomes transmitted across the centuries uh, in, in, the, in the reproduced artifact of the gramophone record and shapes his personality in the, in the present day and restores him to a, a, an aesthetic consciousness and, and perhaps even a kind of um, aesthetic creativity, right? He becomes an artist of sorts. Uh, and then I guess the, the, the last one that I'll mention, and, and perhaps the darkest, is, um, is that I, I think it's, it's 1988 is when he finished it, and it's Pakititi uh, Suchi, so it's like the essence snatchers or the soul stealers, soul kidnappers or something. And, um, and it's about this exact same premise of uh, this special kind of information that's the human soul being broadcast afar and then returns back to its body, but it's now become subject to various forms of breakdown. Uh, it is, um, uh, the, the best qualities of people are, are being uh, kind of skimmed off the top by somebody and then being sold on the black market, right? Mm -hmm. so, uh, so, so this um, essence of the artistic personality that is capable of holding itself together and then travel through space um, ends up, I, I think, through like market pressures, right? And it, it ends up, it ends up becoming alienable, and, and that too is uh, is directly associated with with uh, the artistic process in a diatribe that the narrator gives, in which he says, um, uh, it, it used to be that an artist would create a great work, and now you know it's all it's all the market. Yavam palemu, vumnye groshi, right? So, so it, it, there's something about this uh, this marketability of the artwork. That, that makes the artwork not this grandiose the whole self that becomes projected into the world, but it actually becomes like a little fragmented piece again. And we're, and we're kind of right back where we started, and, uh, and you need something to hold it together, and it turns out to be uh, like the police force, right? So, so you, need, you need this, uh, it, it, this, it, this detective novel in which this intergalactic police force gets together and tries to track down like, the elements of people's personalities and reunite them. So once again, in a, in a kind of, um, in a, in a, there's, a, there's at least some need to introduce a kind of political power in order to stabilize the self uh, now that the, the original romantic paradigm has kind of has kind of fallen away, and Savchenko seems less able than the other authors that I've mentioned to imagine a new kind of aesthetic form that would retain these romantic categories, but also uh, develop them. Um, so that's uh, I, I don't know how I'm doing for time. Uh, we'll be able to find it. You should wrap up. All right. Then, uh, in that case, I'll just wrap up right now instead of, instead of concluding with a with a final anecdote because I know we are pressed. Yeah. Um, I haven't read enough Savchenko to know whether this is a good question, but I wonder, would his interest in cloning be related to the fact that he's Ukrainian and he's a bilingual mm -hmm. writer? Yeah, um, so this, is, this is, is a Soviet science fiction writer. It's, it's, a, it's a fascinating question, and, I, I, and I, I'm sure that it's related. So he, when he's Ukrainian, he wrote both in Russian and in Ukrainian, I believe translated himself mm -hmm. um, at various points. So I'm, I'm positive, actually, that there is something about his fascination with cybernetics and sort of the perfect translatability of the artistic mm -hmm. text from one medium to another, I'm sure that that's informed by his own experience with bilingualism and translation and self-translation. Uh, I, I can't keep track of whose hands are up, but I, I hear... Uh, oh, oh, yeah. okay. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, uh, I really don't know anything about Savchenko, and I can't understand why. I never read it, uh, read, read his things, but when you're talking about cloning doubles, 
of course, you know, понедельник начинается в субботу, yeah. начинает крутиться mm -hmm. в моей голове. Mm -hmm. And how that, and I'm, I'm sure everyone else has the same association. Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit how that connected. A little bit maybe later time, uh -huh. but still it's the same kind of period. Yeah, I think it, it, it going and from like the sixties and then and then continuing. And that's a it's a it's a wonderful text and um, and some of the cybernetic institutes that Savchenko describes in his early texts seem to have some of that whimsicality uh, that the Strugatsky brothers have in that text. Uh, I mean, he's not actually like as great of a writer as the Strugatsky brothers. So oh, that's uh, like a high standard. To say. In, 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 in some ways, he's quite he's quite he's quite heavy-handed. Uh, but I think he, he, he likes the idea of, um, of of the research institute whose job is uh, just sort of to produce things that are magical and then see how they all kind of cross-fertilize with one another. Um, just because I ended with this theme of uh, sort of the alienation of the self in the market, uh, there, there's, there, there's a, a, a scene from, from the Stavgatsky novel that I always think about, which is the one in which um, like, like one of the characters starts stealing time from another one who's not using it very effectively. <laughs> <laughs> it's, like, it's like sort of this parody of sort of like socialist dogmas of productivity, uh, but also like a, a some weird notion of how, of how the, like value is created by the time that you put into something, right? And, and there becomes a kind of... Uh, so sort of accumulation of temporal capital when the people who are best at uh, sort of extracting information out of their time also learn how to exploit the time of other people who then become kind of the, the proletariat of the situation. It's maybe a little bit of parody of Stefanov kind of uh -huh. movement when <laughs> yeah. Stefanov White had a team of people sort of doubles Definitely. working for him. Definitely. I don't yeah. know if they mm -hmm. consciously used it, <laughs> but uh, some kind oh, of I'm, the... I'm, I'm sure they were. I'm sure they were. Yeah, yes, I have four small sections which all collapse into one, <laughs> okay? Um, I'm curious whether the information is for the self or for others, mm -hmm. number one. Uh, I'm also curious whether this is at all linked to the romantic notion of dying into poetry, mm -hmm. with especially, I'm thinking of Shelley, mm -hmm. maybe, but also Keats. Mm -hmm. um, also, is this linked at all with Adoyevsky, Timofeev, and other writers of the 1830s, mm -hmm. and the Künstler novella? Mm -hmm. And then fourth, um, what would support your uh, notion of romantic aesthetics, not that you need the support? Um, there is, of course, the poem by Pushkin, the conversation between mm -hmm. the poet and the bookseller, book which mm -hmm. seems to encapsulate mm -hmm. ideally what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. That's it. Uh, Great. Uh, so. Um, uh, I guess I'm going to touch on, on them in order, but, but probably have time to do so only briefly. And uh, the, the first one, I mean, I think the question of uh, for the self or for others is really an unresolved one mm -hmm. in these texts, and it, and it may be precisely what they're, what they're struggling with, right? So, um, so in the original romantic conception, then, then I think it is for the other. Um, but there's some, there's some kind of fatal limit to that, and, uh, and then it becomes a point in which um, the need to protect the integrity of the artistic self becomes conceivable only through some kind of feedback loop. Mm -hmm. or, I, I think you get this uh, as you get into high modernism with the ideology of sort of like the self-reading book, right? The, the, mm -hmm. the, the, the metafictional book that somehow contains within itself its own reader uh, and, and there's at least a fiction that the text is self-sustaining, or it splits itself up in a way that it can enter into communication with itself and has no need of the external world, that has no need of it. And I think one way of thinking about the clone problematic is that it's a, it's a way of creating um, a kind of figurative community within the artistic text in which the problem of self and ever and other is, is just obviated, right? Like, you don't need to think about that anymore. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm thinking there's a... You know, Varley's story, uh, a, a, a male and female version of the same clone that share the same genetic material, they run away at the end to a planet uh, which they will populate with their own genetically identical progeny, right? So, they're, so their utopia is somehow a planet composed of versions of themselves, mm -hmm. and they say, well, I guess artists are always narcissistic, right? Mm -hmm. So there's this fantasy, like there's a community of others, but the others are somehow already the self, so there's no danger there. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, Amanda? Um, thank you so much for your paper. I, I found it really fascinating. Um, I couldn't help but think of Philip K. Dick when you were talking yeah. about time loops, mm -hmm. of course. And I was wondering if you had looked at the story a little something for us Tempanauts, mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, it's it's essentially a clone watching his yeah. own funeral yeah. in a closed time mm -hmm. loop, so it seems to bring together a lot of the things that that you're looking at, um, you know, Addison Dub 2 is watching Addison Dub 1's funeral yeah. procession. Mm -hmm. So um, it might be worth looking into those stories specifically. I mean, there's so many mm -hmm. that, that deal with time loops. Yeah, I hadn't thought of that story specifically, mostly because I read it so long ago that it, it's not like in my consciousness. But uh, I, I think I think it's absolutely right. There, there are a number of um, there are a number of, of 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 time travel texts that actually come up with something very close to the clone problematic. And, and I think oh, yeah, yeah, and and, uh, and 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 we can easily observe there. There are two instances. There are two science fiction premises in which genetically identical individuals appear in the same place at the same time. One of them is cloning, and um, and one of them is uh, is time travel, in which like you, know, you, you go back in time and meet a, a future or past version of yourself. Sometimes future or past only by a, a, a couple of fractions of seconds. Right. So. Right. Um, they're, they're both about, I think, kind of the, the proliferation of the self through time, at least in certain variations. And there's a great essay by Lotman on doubles, in which um, he, he, he precisely says the, the, the double um, is a way of expressing, kind of in a single text and in a single setting, uh, this problem of historical continuity and historical change. It's a way of taking things that are the same at the beginning and the end of time and putting them in a single text and making them both <coughs> present at the same time within the same aesthetic form. Uh, and I don't know, I don't know, I mean, you, you must know uh, Dave Wittenberg's uh, the Time Travel is a Popular Philosophy of Narrative. Yeah. Right, so it's, he, he talks a bit about, um, he talks a bit about these uh, proliferations of, of self in, uh, in all these time travel texts. Yeah, it's very mm -hmm. uh, it's okay. Last one. Thank you. Okay. Um, yeah, I was also very interested in um, how you described uh, the inner self of the artist mm -hmm. becoming legible as information. Uh, but I was wondering at the same time uh, to which extent you think uh, such an idea of information um, and legibility is compatible with a strong chromatic emphasis on the on ineffability of mm -hmm. the artist. You know the things say Kant and others, uh, Schlegels as well talked yeah. about, mm -hmm. right? The ineffable self. Uh, it, it might be ineffable to the artist, it might be ineffable to, it, to his audience. It, it, and it seems that converting the self into legible information is something rather different. Mm -hmm. And something connected to this is also, again, cloning and it's in connection to romantic aesthetics are very, very interesting. But cloning seems to me to be going somewhat against the romantic stress mm -hmm. on the uniqueness of the subject, of the individual self. That is not uh, cloning as self-expression in art, but cloning as it, an iteration of one individual unique subject mm -hmm. in, in, you know, in multiple copies. Mm -hmm. So basically cloning um, artists becoming legible information and as information, how do you see this compatible with romantic aesthetics? Mm -hmm. Uh, I think that that's precisely the historical crisis that, that clone fiction is trying to articulate. Uh, and, it, and it's one that has to do with the, the development of media technologies. I think that when you, when you look back to, to romantic fiction, then uh, you, you imagine a point which is this kind of Promethean overreach uh, that destroys the artist that attempts to cross that line, right? Uh, so, I guess to, to take a, a, a science fictional version, then, then you've got uh, the Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, where the effort to create a double named after the creator and a kind of allegory of that creator. There's a great Barbara Johnson essay in which she says that this is a kind of figure for autobiography, and mm -hmm. the autobiography that goes too far and ends up becoming this uh, sort of collection of dead parts, right? Um, and uh, and, and there's always that, that punishment for the, for the Promethean creator who crosses the line. 
in, in romantic texts, and, uh, and information uh, somehow becomes incompatible with that ineffability of the soul that you've been describing. Mm -hmm. While Eliot is busy, uh, I would like <laughs> to, to just continue on what mm -hmm. uh, sort of question about romanticism. Mm -hmm. uh, if you look at the figure of the double mm -hmm. in literature, you have it starting from, you know, Gothic novel, mm -hmm. Dostoevsky, mm -hmm. and then Jerome Key. Jerome uses the same double in yeah. his novel, Unfinished, mm -hmm. and the most recent and favorite example is, of course, Harry Potter, mm -hmm. who also sees his double. Mm -hmm. So my question is, to what extent can they stretch their, or kind of uh, apply the notion of romanticism, the mm -hmm. idea that it all comes down from uh, romanticism, mm -hmm. then they're speaking about those such different authors. Mm -hmm. I mean, what is, uh, is it romanticism or is it just the idea of the double, which is probably, you know, was articulated in this movement, but then lost completely any connection to it. So, That's Dima, you're getting in the way of your own talk. <laughs> so if, you could, if, you, if you want to answer briefly, then we really have to move on. Uh, yeah, I mean, obviously there's so much to say here, and, uh, and, and I, I, I'm just more to say in response to Sophie's question as well. Uh, but I, I, guess, I guess the short answer is uh, the word aesthetics is one that's invented by romantic theorists. So whenever we're talking about the aesthetic, I think that we're dealing in some sense with the legacy of, of, of the romantics. Um, and I've been focusing on authors that are explicitly identifying themselves with the legacy of romanticism. Uh, and, I, and I think doing something interesting with it, right? I, I, think, that, I think that there are some other authors that, uh, that fall into a kind of, kind of tepid humanism in, in, a, in a way that the science fiction authors uh, can deal with the same questions uh, and, and and do it, I think, in a more in a more picant way. Uh, but uh, you're you're next, so uh, <laughs> thank you. She used to be at the University of Helsinki, at St. Petersburg State University, University of Kent, and Maison de Sion de Love in Paris. Uh, she's published on literary criticism, cultural studies, memory studies, intellectual history, and um, she's written several books in Russian. Two have recently been translated into English Nightmares from Literary Experiments to Cultural Project, um, and into French, um, Nouveau Portrait de la Russie, Essai sur la Société Gothique. Her latest book, The Celebration of Death in Contemporary Culture, is forthcoming in the spring of 2017, as we so sadly discussed. She's waiting for it to come out, and, and they keep holding on to it. But. <laughs> University of Michigan Press, right? Yes. Okay. So welcome, Diana. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you so much for uh, making me part of this extremely interesting uh, conference. So what I'm going to talk today about uh, is uh, uh, the theme that I'm going to present is on the crossroad of uh, two major themes which are of interest to me at the moment, uh, which is uh, to what extent the statics is a driving force of politics. And as an example of this uh, uh, kind of idea, I'm most interested nowadays in new or neo-medievalism as an aesthetic movement which requires more and more prominence, uh, not explicit, not only in Russia, in Russia is, you know, extremely important, and uh, they just heard about recent German's movie which uses those movies 
uh, crops all the time. But it's also an international phenomenon. It's extremely popular here in the United States and in the West in general. Uh, so uh, I will focus on uh, the Russian uh, utopia, dystopia, and anti-Utopian novels at the moment. Uh, and we'll talk about what Eurasianists or their uh, leaders of Eurasian movement, which is becoming more and more popular nowadays in Russia, what and how they uh, articulate uh, the ideas about the future of what they call Novaya Srednivikovya, <laughs> New Russian Medievalism. So I'm interested today to see how this uh, aesthetics ideas connect with the social world and the social realities of contemporary Russia. Uh, so in 2006, Mikhail Yudlev, former speaker of the Russian parliament, president of the League of the Russian Industrialists, and the member of political movement Eurasia, and also a successful international businessman, published in a utopian novel which is called The Third Empire Becoming Russia, uh, this novel was retrospectively called the favorite book of Kremlin. And this an <coughs> astonishing precision. This, uh, uh, this book describes, at the very beginning, it describes uh, uh, the recent political interventions in Georgia and Ukraine. Uh, and despite what Elliot, uh, Elliot's remark that he hates the science fiction which is all about predictions, well, this book really, they can discuss that it was a prediction or a suggestion for political developments, but indeed it speaks about the war in Georgia, it speaks about the annexation of Crimea, it speaks about the war in Ukraine, and it goes on and on and on, and all this happens in 2006. So this book is written as a textbook by a Latin American historian in 2055 and describes the Third Empire, the Russia, he also calls it the Third Rome. So in this utopia, Russia conquers Europe and the United States from ocean to ocean, at Akiana to Akiana. And the total military victory parade is celebrated in the Red Square. Yuri compares this parade to the victory parade of 1945, not coincidental, of course, and pictures the war prisoners, who, uh, among whom he sees not only generals, but also representatives of the American League, including President Bush first, the former, and I'm quoting now, the former President Bush Jr., Bill Clinton and Hillary Clinton, members of the U.S. government and the Senate, leading bankers and businessmen, journalists and lawyers, pop stars and Hollywood celebrities, all of whom the draft from the Red Squares Square in shackles with a name plate around their neck. And I'm continuing quoting to demonstrate that Russia won not only the American over not only American army, but also the American civilization. And if I would get a little help here, I don't want you to see the pictures before I come to them. So if you can probably make that I have just one slide. Um, you will have to do You will. Just if, you just turn turn around. Around. if you turn around. I think, I think you're only seeing one slide, see? Oh, fantastic. Mm -hmm. Excellent. But it doesn't get to next one. That's you just have to click the small one. Use the already keys. Uh, doesn't work. Uh, so I just. Yep. Excellent. Thank you so much. So as you can see, this is the very recent uh, illustration from Elia Novist, which I very like there. So the total war against the West is led in order to delay the apocalypse. The West plots against Russia. Together this, the devil, whom the Russian emperor considers his personal enemy. And they will see this motive repeated a lot from among those Eurasians who are not writers, but political activists and theory, theoreticians of Eurasian movement, like Dugin, for example. So according to the observers, Putin personally was influenced by this kind of literature, 
And we also know that Russians collectively support those imperial ideas and ambitions. Uh, as uh, the uh, data from the Levada Center shows, the annexation of Crimea, for example, boosts pers Putin's personal approval rate from 65 in January 2014 to 85 in January 2015, and more than 80% of Russia support now the annexation of Crimea. Uh, I'm very interested in how literature relates to life and how literature can suggest the future project. So historically, the idea of empire implies the conquest of land and territories and to satisfy the agrarian hunger for land and capture slaves. The empire also demands for an autocracy and a state monarchy. They need their estate, the society of the states, in, in uh, this idea. So, Despite the fact that those ideas sound very ridiculously anachronistic in, in today's world, those medievalist ideas reverberate in contemporary Russian culture. And I am trying to show, uh, I probably won't have time to go into details today, but I'm trying to show that the new consensus between the political power and uh, uh, society is built around this new medieval uh, ideology. Uh, so uh, I will look today uh, at the developments in Russian domestic situation to consider how Russian imperial dreams influence its people who <coughs> support those international politics. Uh, and more precisely, I will examine how the current political discourse <coughs> and post-Soviet novels reflect the rising popularity of the society of the states, caste society, and serfdom among Russians. So let us come back to Yuri's novel, uh, the Third Empire novel, to consider how its author envisions the social structure of Russian society. In his utopia, Russians are called the core nations. And uh, among the population of this empire, of this utopian empire, the number of people, of Russian people by blood is growing, while the number of people of other nations is rapidly declining. Only Russians have a right to choose freely where to live and what occupation they will have. But the rest of nations that are conquered by the Third Empire have none of those rights. So they are krepasne. In the novel, Russia is, of course, an uh, orthodox autocracy. The Russian constitution, and now I quote, differs from the rest of the world because its social organization is that of the society of the state and because the principles of Russian self-identification is the uh, uh, autonomy and nationalism. Yuriv describes as his novel Aprichniki. Aprichniki is this first <coughs> estate which has all power in their hands, all political power. They elect the emperor and they run the rest of their uh, empire by terror as Aprichniki should. Mm. The social organization is the society of the state and uh, uh, Yuriv's Aprichniki report exclusively and directly to the emperor and rule the society by completely under state uh, terror. The two other states, the clergy and the third estate, have no political rights at all, and they pay all the taxes. <coughs> uh, in Yuri's dream empire, uh, <coughs> serfdom is a norm, and people are naturally ascribed as sort of belong to the land. And as you all know, in 2006, a couple of months after uh, this uh, Yuri's uh, utopia was published, Vladimir Sorokin's Day of Appreciation was written as a response to Yuri's novel <coughs> shortly after its publication of the Third Empire. And I won't go here into any details describing Sorokin's novel because you all remember what it is. It sets up, uh, it sort of presents Moscow in 2027 they are under the period of unrest. 
Russia becomes an autocracy and uh, Aprishnik is indeed running this completely medieval society uh, uh, walled off from the rest of the world by the great Russian wall implementing actually once again kind of uh, foretelling Trump project about the United States. Uh, Sorokin describes Russian economy, they chase um, uh, sells oil and gas and lives on the duty fees raised by the transport of Chinese food into Europe. It's an extremely violent society. It's it's ruled by terror and in the opening scene of this novel you who, who really will never forget is a scene of extreme violence, a sexual violence. And so on. So in this utopia, uh, in this, I'm sorry, dystopia, there are Stolbavu Bayari, uh, the Procuturian aristocracy, high bureaucracy, operations, paramilitary security, and of course serfs, uh, uh, the slaves, or smirbis, how they're called. So they have the, absolutely the same <coughs> social structure reproduced in this dystopian novel. And the response to Sarokin novel also followed shortly. In 2008, Maxim Kononenko published an anti-utopian novel titled the, I, well, you, you probably can help me if there's a better English translation of this book. I translate it as Day of the A Student, or Day as an Honest Student, Denia Tlitschinka. So once again, they are, the, the action unfolds in a neo-medieval setting in this novel, the medievalism is established by the Birch Revolution. This revolution, led by Boris Berezovsky, and irony kind of is no longer applicable after his death in London to this whole thing. So the Birch Revolution brings victory to the liberal democratic intelligentsia, which makes human rights watch its symbol. Russia becomes an egalitarian society and overcomes all <coughs> corruption by banning money, prohibiting production of oil and gas, and the usage of electricity. Russia's natural resources are sold to the international co corporation Procter and Gamble, which is considered Russian benefactor. This society also lives in a state of terror imposed by the human rights defenders and in quasi-medieval poverty, Causes other means of transportation, comfortable house trailers are lighted by candles and heated by burning birch, which is the only source of energy in the society. The hierarchy of the society is represented as 140 story freedom house building. Their high bureaucracy is placed according to their ranks. And that on the top of the structure, the Russian human rights defenders cannot penetrate seats their uh, corporation Procter and Gamble. But the social structure is describes very kind of precisely the Greek democracy because all Russians are equal, but Kyrgyz people are domesticated slaves. And they are sort of used as much as horses are used and are completely interchangeable with the horses. So if you look at post-Soviet film, uh, we can see that Aprichina remains a very important and uh, metaphor. And medievalism, Russian medievalism, becomes a way to describe Putin's Russia. This is Ivan Lungin, and here is another film by uh, Vladimir Mirzoyev, uh, which is there, uh, Pushkin's drama Boris Godunov is uh, transplanted to contemporary Moscow. Here, uh, Bayard's Russian high officials are driving Mercedes. The Chronicle team is writing his chronicle on MacBook, and the Tsar's orders are delivered by TV. So critics attributed <coughs> the success of the film to the extraordinary feeling of authenticity produced by the fusion of medieval illusions this post-Soviet reality. Well, I don't have time now to discuss in details why Aprichin is such a wonderful metaphor for Putin's Russia. I will just remind you all about this very important word, bespredel. 
Mannheim or out of orders, without which the situation in contemporary Russia politically cannot be understood. But that's probably what makes this metaphor and the preaching in particular such an eloquent way to describe contemporary Russia. So what is the point I'm trying to make is the following. <clears throat> Both the critics of Putin authoritarian regime, such as Sorokin, and anti-liberal writers such as Kononenko, and of course Eurasianism as Yuri, who we discussed at the beginning, all are using neo-medieval metaphors and neo-medieval uh, ideas to express their own ideas about Russian future. Most importantly, in all three cases, Russia is described as a caste society. Serfdom is an inevitable part of its social structure, both for critics and for the admirers of Putin's vision. The Eurasian ideology proved powerful enough to impose its discourse and its vision of the future on the post-Soviet society. Now, let me change my subject a little bit and uh, speak for a couple of seconds about how the current political discourse digest this fantasy and ideology. And in contemporary political discourse, if you look at the forums, if you hear, you know, uh, look at the media in general, you can see that Russia and Putinism is constantly referred to as feudal system or medievalism, средневековье, да, феодальное общество. This is current. And what is most interesting for me is that the medieval word <coughs> halop, which means serf. Uh, it comes from the 10th century Ruska Pravda, the first Russian legal uh, code. Uh, <coughs> this word dominates nowadays contemporary discourse and becomes almost synonymous with people in the Narod. There are critics of Putin's regime who use the word hello to deny what's going on in contemporary Russia, to criticize Putinism. But there are other people who like this word and who use in relation to themselves the following uh, medieval terms like buy-in, e, uh, another word which is very important, государевы I don't know how to translate it. If somebody can come up with the translation for государевы люди. State people. Yeah. Kings. Huh? Kingsman. Kingsman. Yes, that's very important. Kingsman. Thank you. Um, so, it's if you look up the word "kalop" on, if you Google it, you will see immediately what I'm talking about. I don't have time to just demonstrate it. Uh, so, and in the internet, there are a number of prank interviews, constituents, <coughs> all kind of prank which talks about this idea of upcoming serfdom in, in Russia. For example, there is a prank interview with Nikita Mikhalkov, uh, the film director, who there was a kind of prank idea that he is filming a movie where Russia is becoming a serfdom state. The serfdom in Russia becomes, I'm rubbing up. Oh, even if I'm bragging up, this is a beautiful thing. I mean, if it, yeah, I hope you can see that. My body in pure, после порки. This is журнал работница, да? Which is transformed into журнал крепостая. Uh, so, and then I'm wrapping up, and I'm not going to talk here about the uh, society of the state and uh, schools who are demonstrating that they have already an estate society in Russia, like Simeon Kartonsky, who brings together very interesting uh, material about that. Uh, let me just finalize by saying that Eurasianism, there is not only this kind of prank and fiction movies and novels, there is this very important political movement which is highly influential nowadays in, in the Kremlin politics, which prioritizes the serfdom and the caste society and propagates neo medievalism <coughs> According to Eurasianism and 
Here I quote, ancient states and social political systems were built upon the caste principles. That means that people of, as I can continue quoting, of godlike souls, and there are people of animalistic souls, animalistic or daimonic, and caste reflects this nature of the soul that people cannot alter during their lifetime. Normal society should be built in such a way as to have people of godlike nature on top. They lead, and the people of animalistic or daimonic nature on the bottom. And here is my <coughs> hero, Valery Zoykin, who is the chair of the uh, Constitutional Council of uh, Russia. He recently published a very important article in uh, Rossiyska Gazeta. There, this is what he says about slavery. He is not a regional thinker. It doesn't come from his role thinking about Russian history or Russian future. He just rehearses what the Kremlin ideologists consider the political project for Russia. And let me alert, finalize by quoting some numbers. In the Global Slavery Index of 2014, which demonstrate the prevalence of slavery based on the percentage of the population enslaved and the estimated number of people enslaved in a country, Russia occupies the 32nd place. In comparison, the United States occupies the 145th place. Russia is the fifth among India, China, Pakistan, and Uzbekistan by total number as enslaved per country. There is one million slaves, according to Walk Free Association and other estimates. <coughs> Slavery is an everyday occurrence in Russia. It touches upon agriculture, army, it ranges really throughout all spheres of economical activity in the society. And Eurasian ideas about the social structure of the future Russia legitimizes this uh, caste society, and it's gaining more and more followers. And uh, recently, a, a friend of mine, an American historic, historian, after having read one of my articles, he said, well, I can't believe it, Tina. How could it be that ordinary people, ordinary Russians, would support such an idea? And the question is, uh, the answer to this question is really very simple. Russians assume that they will not be slaves. They will be Tajiks, Bashkir, and other people who will represent the bottom of the social pyramid, while all immigrants from North Korea and China. There is this silent assumption by the Russian nationalists, which is that the lower states or castes will be formed by non-Russian immigrants from the Soviet Republic, former Soviet Republic, North Korea, and China. Uh, recent legal initiatives may support this unspoken assumption. For example, there, there has been recently passed a new law according to which uh, there, uh, and the history of this thing is just mind blowing, but I don't have time to go into it. According to which, there are immigrants from North Korea and China who will be employed for the federal construction projects for the world football camp will be exempt from the labor code. And here I stop. Thank you very much. That's good. So, thank you for this talk. I, I want to push back a little bit on Yuryev. Um, I'm sorry? I wanted to, to respond about Yuryev. Um, uh -huh. Not to try to defend you, I, I really loathe this novel. It's really god awful. But, um, but I, I don't think this is exactly what Yuri is about. I mean, yes, there's a medieval setup, but he's more about amalgamation. His big concern seems to be nothing can be small. Everything in the world has to be huge. There can be three empires. Even you know, Protestantism is too small to bother with. Um, mm. That it's all about amalgamation, and there are no serfs. In, um, yes. There are no serfs in Turkey. They're not serfs. They they, they 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 pay taxes. They're not tied to the land. They no, pay no, taxes. No. Uh, Elliot, uh, there are several categories of people. Remember, first of all, 
nations like Baltic states, Ukraine, and yes. Poland, they are to be erased. Yes, I'm, I'm not defending. Why the Russians? <laughs> yes. No, 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 yeah. no. They are talking about precisely the social structure <coughs> of yes. the third empire. So those nations are erased. There are some nations which are elevated almost to the status of the Russian core people, like Germans. such as precisely Germans. And there is this beautiful discussion why they decided to burn Jews. That's, you know, they should have found us an institute. Yeah. But the, the important thing is that the rest of the nations, majority of them, they are Kripasni. They cannot change where they live. They cannot move freely in their borders of the empire. And they cannot choose freely their occupation. This is what I consider serfdom. I I go by the constitutional definition of what serfdom is. It's a forced labor. I did not read this this novel, of course. Amazing. Yeah, no, this <laughs> not 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 great. But from my point of view, like you described it, it sounds like brilliant satire. If only. No, no, it's, it's, it's not. It's not. But you describe it as satire because it's not possible to believe it. Oh, yes. I, I, I just cannot be too serious satire. speaking it's about it. It's probably my fault, and you rightly point out that I should be more kind of <laughs> academic, probably, in my presentation. It's hilarious when you read it. Everybody yeah, laughed at it back in 2006 until the annexation, the war in Georgia, the annexation of Crimea happened. And until guys like Dugin, Yuhiv, and several others really gain political power and prominence in, in contemporary Russia. But uh, Ksenov also wrote Ost of Krim mm -hmm. yeah. about Crimea. It's, it's kind of, uh, well, you Aksyon, see, it's not yeah, like. Aksyonov is very, very good. Uh, yes, I understand that. <laughs> it's <laughs> anyway, it's uh, one prediction, one and I know exactly what. what it's, it's a different kind of yeah, uh, but it's possible okay. to happen between Do you me want me to read you the quote about no, the no, annexation of Crimea? <laughs> there was a 1990s porn magazine that predicted the um, annexation of Crimea. Yeah. Seriously, I write about it. <laughs> yeah. and look, I'm not saying that they were the only, I mean, Yuri was the only Cassandra of yeah. Putin to predict mm -hmm. the annexation of Crimea. The point I'm making is mm -hmm. that because this political scenario was so closely followed, I decided that they should be proactive and look at what social future, what social kind of organization of Russian society does this imperial idea bring to visit. Mm -hmm. And I believe that given that some of this uh, for future telling has already taken place. This should be really serious about it. And indeed, there's a question. Yeah. <laughs> okay. No, I was, I, uh, well, I have two hard questions since this is the first question I'm asking. I'll go with both parts. First of all, I was curious about the terminology um, on the basis of your talk. Um, there is serfdom and then there's slavery. You are speaking in a trans geographical context, I noticed. So, I mean, what's the distinction between these two? Do they just flow into each other? You know, you concluded with cross-border contemporary institutions of trafficking, trafficking. Mm -hmm, yes. slavery. Like, it kind of all flows in a continuum. Is there a distinction between them? If so, why is it necessary or important for your project? Uh, well, the, 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 you, those terms are pretty much interrelated. Uh, then you look at the slavery. I, I take for definition of the slavery, the current definition of the constitution of Russian Federation. Slavery means a forced labor. If you are not paid for the labor you are doing and you cannot deny, you cannot escape from working for someone without being paid, that juridically is considered slavery. But then I'm talking about serfdom, I mean Kripasnoe Trav. And that means a different form of uh, slavery, where the person is attached to the land, the person is bound to the land, and cannot be separated 
from the land. So in addition to being a slave, this person cannot also move any place or have belongings of a particular kind. So there, uh, uh, when we speak about Eurasianism, they really want to have uh, serfdom. They are not that interested in slave trade or human trafficking. But if they look at contemporary Russia, this is the country which is a leader of slave trade. And of course, I, I simply didn't have time to say that uh, serfdom has been already introduced by uh, Putin's administration in some very particular sense. We, we have now all those categories of people who cannot leave Russia any longer. But who is passports, why? international passports, they're arrested and uh, taken away from them. I, I just wanted to ask about data, right? I mean, you said that like Russia is the on slave top trade. of slave trade. Like, what, what, what? Well, there, there are there are a couple of there are a couple of uh, foundations. There is so-called global slave index, mm -hmm. uh, and there is also an Australian foundation, Walk Free, and those two organizations are doing quite a bit of, uh, they are possessing their largest database about, uh, you know, they measure the slave, uh, this uh, proportion of people enslaved in different countries. So that's the sort. But also if you look at several uh, Russian uh, human rights organizations which are trying to rescue people from slavery, they're you don't have kind of reliable statistics from those sources, but you get from them a lot of <coughs> stories. And uh, for example, some of them would focus on Dagestan and will try to rescue people who are being sold there for, you know, bricks factories. They work, you know, trying to rescue. There is sexual slavery, of course, and there are human rights defenders who are trying to rescue people from there. The interesting thing is that uh, it enters the news. Quite often you hear those stories, like for example in 2009 uh, in Tve, uh, near by Yasna Poliana, people were, uh, uh, oh I'm sorry, in, in, in Tula, people were enslaved in uh, in hospitals, they were made, you know, uh, in, enslaved in uh, like medical workers. Yeah, you know, it's almost five o'clock, so I. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Very very quick. And then we'll it really is, have to go. It's not even a question. Uh, you mentioned Sai, two thousand nine, and we cross pollinated the subject and the director. It's Pavel Lungin. Ivan Grozny is the subject. You need the director Ivan Lungin. Oh, I don't think you should be identified with yeah. the subject. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much. She's published in 19th and 20th century Russian poetry, post Soviet literature, and contemporary Baltic literatures and cultures. Her book, Silence and the Rest, Verbal <coughs> Skepticism in Russian Poetry, was brought up by Northwestern in 2013, and now she's writing a monograph on Vita Kilid. Um, and the title of her talk is Butterflies and Sunflower Oil, Alternative History to Vita Kilid. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, first of all, uh, Kilevin recently started to apologize a lot with his books because of uh, perhaps due to a lot of criticism. So I will imitate him and I, I will start with an apology. Mainly uh, about my PowerPoint, which is a very imperfect clone of the one I left in Ann Arbor. Oh. <laughs> so the other one had lots of butterflies on it. 
and you do not have typos. If you see typos here, please accept my most abject apologies. <laughs> Elliot was very kind to lend me his computer for 10 or 15 minutes, and that's what I was able to prepare. Um, I want to talk about alternative history as subgenre of science fiction. Uh, and the recent decades uh, have seen a boom in alternative history in the West uh, and in Russia. Uh, both ex explored by both pop culture and uh, some major writers. So uh, the genre has risen to prominence in post-Soviet Russia and a lot of mainstream as well as sci-fi uh, practitioners started enthusiastically spinning of what would have happened if scenarios. As the popular writer satirist Mikhail Zadornov quipped in 1997, uh, Russia is a great country with an unpredictable past. <laughs> And that almost was obviously a humorous response to the previously suppressed facts of Soviet history coming to light under Perestroika. In her uh, scholarly study of, of the post-Soviet condition, uh, Rosalind Marsh notes likewise that the genre of alternative history has become so typical of post-Soviet Russia because Russians have experienced the constant rewriting of their country's history. Marsh notes uh, the flourishing of alternative history, the fantastic historical novel, and historiographic metafiction, and she cites uh, Pietzuk, Sharov, Sarokin, and Bikov as some of the more prominent practitioners. Uh, given Plevin's acute instinct for the icons and cliches of contemporary cultural consciousness, our uh, fantasies of alternative history could fa hardly fail to get his attention. And they have, uh, from his early story, uh, Hrustal Minu, The Crystal World of 91, to, uh, to his now classic Chupayev uh, Ipustata, Buddha's Little Finger of 1996, all the way to his recent his installments such as uh, Love uh, for Three Zuckerbrins, we bought Triumph Zuckerbrin of 2014, and uh, the most recent two volume, Smatriti, The Border of 2015. So, what I want to, to do in this talk is to briefly place a Love for Three Zuckerbrins in the framework of alternative history and discuss the functions alternative history, or A.H., to be brief, takes form in Kiriadin's work. Uh, this book consists of five parts. Uh, parts 1, 3, and 5 are entitled Kiklop, uh, a variation on Cyclops. And parts 2 and 4 are called A Kind People and the system, respectively. <laughs> uh, in the opening of the story, uh, the narrator acquires a clairvoyant third eye and becomes one of a group of the select whose duty is to keep the world in balance. He performs the service by entering people's consciousness and making them act in a manner that prevents major historical cataclysms. The same opening section lays out the novel's central event, and that is a slaughter in the offices of the liberal website, uh, website Contra Rule, uh, meaning Colta Rule. Uh, the slaughter is carried out by Islamic terrorist and suicide bomber Abatu Karayev. The next section, Kind People, uh, reimagines the smartphone game Angry Birds is an evil cosmogony. Uh, in the reversal of the game in which the human player throws little birds against a pig, in Pelevin, all-powerful and malignant bird-like uh, entities hurl humans as living weapons against the world's creator. And the creator is envisioned somewhat parodically as a great uh, boar or swine. In part three, the narrative returns to the life of the site Contra Room, 
and focuses on one of, of its employees, Kesha. Uh, Kesha is an internet troll. He is also enamored of online pornography, and he is one of Batukarayev's victims. The penultimate section, the system, uh, offers an account of a futuristic dystopian society uh, which has strong overtones of uh, 1984 and also the Matrix trilogy. In this dystopia, the future versions of uh, Kesha and terrorist Batu live in coffin-like modules are uh, utterly immersed in virtual reality. Uh, and the final segment of the narrative, part five, uh, depicts a future reincarnation uh, of the contra, uh, contra office custodian, Nadia. Uh, Nadia is a compassionate young woman who is untouched by the contemporary uh, climate of violence. She is indifferent to politics, the media, and online diversions. Like everyone else at Contra Runadi is exterminated by Batu. In the future, she reemerges as an angel in a private paradise like realm that is inhabited by a group of little animals. And Nadia is taking care of those animals as best as she can. Uh, this uh, seemingly motley assemblage of stories is actually connected in a manner familiar from Pilevin's earlier collections. Each inserted tale uh, contains multiple cross-references to the other sections of the book. Uh, thus, Batu's extermination of the staff of Contaru in the book's <coughs> present is reprised twice in the book's alternative futures. First, in Kesha's 21st century Moscow, uh, where Karayev kills people by releasing deadly code into their shared virtual reality. And next, in Nadia's Paradise, where Batu, a turned serpent, sets out to destroy all the living creatures. And there are mul multiple other linkages as well. So the angry birds of kind people reappear as Zuckerbrins in the Kesha dystopia. And the Zuckerbrin is a portman of word made up from Mark uh, Zuckerberg, co-founder of Facebook, and Sergey Brin, uh, founder of Google. In the futuristic dystopia, Zuckerbrins are sili silicon organic alien entities, uh, and they look like evil bird-like creatures. Uh, they are positioned behind the screen, and humans are enslaved to them. Kesha, Batu, and Nadia are referenced throughout the book, and there are other linkages which are, are perhaps less important. So, in a narrative that is concerned with historical processes, cause effect chains, and the relationship between the past, present, and future, such a labyrinth of linkages, and here I am being Tolstoy, uh, carries obvious thematic as well as structural value. In fact, uh, the book is packed with Kiklov's theorizing on historiography and more specifically on alternative history, sci-fi alternative history. He discourses on, among other issues, uh, determinism, chance, and the freedom of choice. Uh, in particular, he covers, to mention but a few popular AH paradigms, contingency, the butterfly effect, chaos theory, points of divergence, uh, historical events with more than one possible outcome, multiverse, the hypothetical set of possible universes, and quantum mechanics to account for the splitting of worlds. And I will talk a bit about these concepts more. 
the narrator launches his discussion of alternative history by juxtaposing two historical accounts. One that is real, in which the former Ukrainian president Viktor Yanukovych is removed from power in the course of Euromaidan 2013-2018, uh, and one that is hypothetical, in which Yanukovych remains in office for another six months. In this scenario, uh, a Maidan protester has to join other activists one evening in February of 2014. To join them, he must cross um, a street on the way to Maidan. Whether he does or does not cross the street, safely depends on a cigarette ash that may or may not fall on his clothes from the cigarette of a man smoking on the balcony above. In the good case scenario, the ash does not fall on him, he does not stop to brush it off in the middle of the street, and he is not injured by a passing car. In the bad case scenario, he is injured and unable to join uh, his friend, friend protesters. The precise timing of the cigarette ash falling in turn depends on whether the smoker's wife rings him on the phone one minute earlier or later. And so on and so forth, as Kiklov traces the tiny links in this chain of cause and effect to the farthest one, whether a certain female citizen does or does not take her umbrella <coughs> along on her way to the subway. And so, writes Pilevin, all the other wheels of history, great and small, come into motion. Thus, strange as it may seem, a major historical event, such as the removal of Yanukovych from power, is contingent on the seemingly minor circumstance of the lady taking or not taking her umbrella. Uh, this story illustrates the way major historical processes may depend on apparently trivial contingencies. As Kiklop explains, the flow of history consists of, quote, uh, billions of interwoven causal consequential connections, endlessly ancient and totally senseless in their diversity, but directing the current of life. These connections, Indians call them karma, are not at all accidental because they proceed from the impulse that has brought this world into being. But every complex system has its failures and distortions that can fortunately be straightened out." Unquote. And this is precisely Kiklov's duty, to intuit where the fragile balance of the world might get disrupted, and to correct this disruption as efficiently as possible. The cigarette story is the narrator's playful instantiation of the butterfly effect, uh, whereby a small change in initial conditions results in large differences in a later state. And from here, Kiklop enters into a detailed discussion of the basic stables of alternative history sci-fi, which are clustered around the butterfly effect. Thus, he refers uh, to uh, Bradbury's well-known story, a Sound, uh, a Sound of Thunder, where, in which a tiny alteration in the distant past, a crushed butterfly, snowballs into major historical changes later. Next, he references the movie The Butterfly Effect, in which uh, the protagonist uh, redoes various things in his past real-time travel, and thus he initiates multiple alternative futures and brings on plenty of uh, mayhem to himself and to, to others. And subsequently, Kiklop also discourses on the butterfly effect in chaos theory, according to which a butterfly flapping its wings in New Mexico might cause a hurricane in China. Uh, 
Um, okay. Now this disquisition on the butterfly effect, which is so important for um, AH, is followed by Kiklop delving into another key concept of AH sci-fi, multiverse. He notes that today's physicists, at least some, believe in the existence of an infinite number of parallel universes. Together, this form the multiverse. Here, Kiklox refers to Schrodinger's experiment in which a cat placed in a box, maybe alive or dead, uh, dependent on a subatomic, subatomic event that may or may not occur. When one looks in the box, one sees the cat as either alive or dead, not both at the same time. Kirchhoff also alludes to Everett's hypothesis that the cat is both alive and dead, regardless of whether the box is opened, but that the alive and dead cats are in different branches of the universe that are equally real but cannot interact with each other. Also, as is common with more recent AH, uh, Kiplop posits the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics as his uh, nauch pop, right? Pop scientific basis for multiverse. So on one level, uh, this book reads like a basic user's guide to popular AH sci-fi. Uh, but Pelevin, uh, fortunately, does not stop here. Uh, generic staples like Bradbury and others are unexpectedly mixed up with the classics of Russian historical fiction, and they are a writer's own metaphysical preoccupations like uh, solipsism, Taoism, and some others. So the mean-spirited female citizen, Vredna Grazdanka of the cigarette story, obviously alludes to Bulgakov's Annushka, mm -hmm. who has already bought the sunflower oil mm -hmm. and not only bought it, but spilled it. Uh, Annushka's incident illustrates the potential tr transformative value of a tiny detail in the larger chain of causes and effects. And that's a concept that is of, of central importance to AH. Likewise, all the other wheels of history, great and small, coming into motion, mimic Tolstoy's historiographic, in this case, mechanistic historiographic metaphors uh, that are so numerous in war and peace. In Tolstoy's now classic critique of 19th century historiography, linear and coherent accounts blot out the importance of contingency. Uh, speaking in the popular current idiom of A.H. sci-fi, Annushka's spilling of oil and Andrew's living moments in Andrew Balkonsky's living moments with multiple potentials in them are Bulgakov's and Tolstoy's versions of the butterfly effect avant la lettre. But butterflies proliferate further in Pilevin, and here he mentions, uh, Kiklop mentions, uh, Zhuangzi's dream of when uh, the philosopher wakes up, he asks himself if he is Zhuangzi who has dreamt of being a butterfly or if he is a butterfly dreaming that he is the philosopher. This is something we may term the butterfly effect as well, though maybe more as a pun. Uh, more Eastern metaphysics fly into the picture uh, the multitude of tiny causal consequential connections are, as Kiplo points out, called karma by Indians. Uh, likewise, the Kesha and Nadia of the future are conceived of as their karmic reincarnations. However, there is a real question as to what extent these classical visions are compatible with the generic staples of A.H. And that's what I would like to talk about in the uh, last section of this talk. So, uh, of course, uh, the concatenation of small, seemingly accidental events leading to various deaths is directed by Wolland. 
Also important is that Almushka facilitates Berlioz's punishment for his sins, and that Berlioz's afterlife is non-existent because each will be given according to his face. Zbolos po tvoje is the phrase that occurs toward the end of Pilevin's book. In Tolstoy, every moment offers a multitude of potential actions that could shape the future in different ways, but simultaneously Tolstoy insists on the moral importance of what one does at each particular moment to bring the providential future into being. And as regards Juanze, uh, his, uh, uh, his uh, alleged anticipation of multiverse, because according to Kiklop, uh, the Taoist philosopher anticipated multiverse, is predicated not on time travel or quantum mechanics, but on the philosophical concept of solipsism. While we dream, we say dreams are real, and what, what we take to be reality are perspectives embedded in our consciousness. So, uh, Levin essentially removes uh, the many worlds theory of A.H. sci-fi into a distinct vision of his own. It is known that quantum systems are dependent on the observer. To punish or pardon the cat about whom it is known that there is a 50% probability that it is alive, one has to open the door of the box where the sadist Schrodinger has placed it. The human taking himself as ruler simply measures the universe and comes up with the corresponding world. Um, it is doubtful that either Schrodinger or Everett uh, were concerned with the mind making its own reality and still less with ethics. But this is precisely what concerns Pirlevin. And it is in this direction that he is steering the whole discussion. So the vision that emerges from this bricolage of pop and high cultural historiographic and fantastic historiographic notions is, I think, best dramatized through their position between Kesha's dystopic and Nadia's idyllic futures. Both are their individual presence projected into the future and dependent on of the moment individual ethical or unethical choices. Kesha's uh, matrix-like future existence intensifies his present values and vices like internet trolling and pornography. Uh, the dystopian narrative, we may say, bears the implied if this goes on a generic impulse. Analogously, Nadi's compassion and immunity to the current climate of violence extend into her future private Eden-like realm. So, as I see it, Pilevin reinterprets the multiverse of A.H. sci-fi as a constellation of individual ethics-dependent projections. In this uh, cosmogony, uh, one cannot cross timelines via complicated time travel technology as in technophile AH sci-fi, but only through individual moral choice. And the book's concluding pages are quite explicit on this point. Uh, we travel between worlds when we transform our habits and inclinations. Such an effort, a barely noticeable, hard to define, and even happening at an unclear temporal point, is that very space engine that carries us from one universe to another. When we consciously change something in our lives, we do not transform ourselves and our world, as supposed by the classics of Marxism, but transfer to a different train of fate that moves across a different universe. A slow but most reliable way to cross over into happy worlds is described in all ancient books. In the section of them that is dedicated, sorry for this <laughs> cliche, <laughs> commandments. <laughs> and actually, sorry for the cliche is the, word, uh, is the phrase Pilevin uses in English. <laughs> to conclude, 
uh, Pilevin handles alternative history in a manner typical of, of his approach to pop cultural paradigms in general. Uh, we are a night's move, if we borrow Shlovsky's term, or in Pilevin's own parlance through a somersault uh, of sort. Uh, he no longer appears interested in ironic meta-commentary on Russia's unpredictable history or in challenging realistic and documentary historic genres in the manner of postmodern historiographic metafiction as theorized by Hutchin. Nor is he keen on polemicizing against Marxist theological historiography and the concepts of logic and progress. Neither does he, I think, primarily react to the trauma of Russian Soviet history, whether in an admiring, revanchist, or ironic, deconstructive manner. Instead, uh, Pilevin translates the generic cliches of AH sci fi into metaphysical and moral issues. One might say he transforms uh, the Turtle Dove franchise or the Wolfenstein shooter into bits of Tolstoy, Bulgakov, and Zhuangzi joined in unexpected ways and ultimately molded into his own distinct vision. What emerges from love uh, for three Zuckerbins, therefore, is, I think, an unorthodox alternative to and a critique of the more uh, mimetic forms of alternative historical imagination. Thank you. Thank you. We have a little time for questions and uh, comments. Um, I have a very simple question, if you don't mind it. Um, the final quote from Sarokin that you mentioned, that you, you know, showed on the board. Um, Pilevin. Pilevin, sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, yeah, that's not the question. Um, um, you know, uh, yes, exactly. I mean, the, you know, the turn to commandments. Um, is that a turn to metaphysics and moral issues, or a turn to religion? And, you know, um, it seems to me that in a certain sense, the notion of commandments is very different from metaphysics. So I'm sure I missed something in your talk, and I just wanted to ask about that. Well, I, 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 I'm not sure I would uh, see uh, such a strong division between the religion, morals, and metaphysics, right? Because religion, various religions, I think, offer their metaphysical morals, mm -hmm. for one thing. And uh, as far as morals are concerned, uh, Christianity in particular, and that something Pilevin seems to be uh, referring to here, uh, apart from his usual interest in Buddhism and Taoism, is definitely uh, very much concerned with, with moral issues. So I'm not sure I would uh, separate them in, in, in such a clear manner. But he is interested in, uh, I would say, he's, yes, he is interested in uh, ethics and morals, and he uh, suggests that uh, religious texts like uh, the New Testament uh, are, you know, sort of the best presentation, the, the, the best vehicles uh, for uh, presenting ethics and morals. I didn't think that's a question. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Obviously, I don't raise my hand high enough. Mm -hmm. You know, what I'm really, I mean, this uh, to some extent relates to your paper, but um, this is a more kind of general question. Um, I'm just wondering, like, starting with the framework of alternative history, it's a very provocative place from which to think about um, how to read, like, this contemporary science fictional SFNF narratives that are being spoken about here. We've had a lot of them mentioned. Like, do you people who, I don't do this contemporary stuff, so the people who do, including yourself, since you're talking about history particularly, like how um, generative is it uh, to do allegorical readings? Not that I'm accusing everybody of doing allegorical readings, but is an allegorical reading of text such as this as a reflection on some sort of consensual reality like you know political reality 
um, consensual notions of history. Um, uh, I mean, what is it doing to that reality? What is that relationship? I know this is a very abstract question, but I'm, I'm really interested as, like, what is the meta-narrative, right, that is emerging from the various kind of historical frameworks in which we can read these contemporary works of science fiction. Anita, could you maybe be a little bit more specific? I, uh, yeah, I wish, because they're all very different, right? Because Pelevin, it seems to me, is very self-conscious about this. That's why this question came to me now, rather than earlier, whereas the orcs are not, probably, right? <laughs> they're not being so Some reflective. Of Some of them maybe are more reflective yes. than others. But maybe we can also save this for the end. I yeah. realize that this started with your own paper actually this morning. This right? I mean as to read then, you know, to make a kind of a science fictional reading of Russian twentieth and twenty first century Russian cultural history, right? But can we do that? Okay. So, so was your question basically about to which extent a science fictional reading of this book in particular is generative? No, okay, let me let me channel Nietzsche. How is <laughs> How, what does contemporary Russian science fiction and fantasy say about the uses and abuses of history? Well, I wouldn't answer for all of contemporary no. Russian fantasy and yeah. science fiction. Uh, what do you perceive as uses and abuses of history in this text in particular? What are you referring to, uh, what are you referring to in Pelina? So, for, uh, yeah, well, I mean, you know, so for example, one of the things obviously that's being channeled via all kinds of Orientalist tropes is that, that there is no one linear notion of history, right? That one, one framework is, you know, the to marry this whatever, karma, Taoism, etc., etc., the multiverses of oriental philosophies with chaos theory, right? So this is one. So then, believe in, yeah, that's, mm -hmm. you know. So, so it's a rejection of causal linear history, right? So this is one thing that I'm seeing over here. Are there, so I, I mean, as I said, this is a question perhaps to save for the end. Because I'm really curious, because somehow, like all the papers that I've heard on contemporary science fiction and fantasy, seems oh. to have history as this huge kind of backdrop. Absolutely. What is the relationship? How can yeah. I theorize it? It's for me fascinating um. because I'm totally ignorant about it. Okay, you agree, right? So uh, you can say this, this is what I was question. saying about going yeah. to the past. And this is what I'm, I'm saying, writing about now, that the, the history is all fantasy. Mm. Um, so and, history is fantasy. But history functions no, as fantasy. History, history. History. No, but history, but history is also functioning as the, as the fantastic backdrop. Um, yes, absolutely. Because yeah. you're making, yeah. I mean, you, you're putting together the reference that, that means something to you, right? You know, Russian history is all, you know, medieval times. Russian history is all this. What are, and yes. um, all of these mm -hmm. myths. And, and they may as well be Middle Earth. Mm -hmm. so, the, yes. so there is no like thing as history left anymore, it's become this contesting field of fantastic representations, is that what? Well, in the genre, it seems to I me. I would think so, but to some extent. Maybe that had to happen after all of the reportage of the 90s, last <laughs> era, and... Um, mm -hmm. I, I don't think uh, we, the genre of history really, really disappeared, but, but, you know, there are different literary subgenres and groups, right? This is this in particular is this alternative history, right? Which positions itself as science fiction. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't mean that all of history disappeared, historical science, historiography, but this is one particular branch of you know one particular way of thinking about history, which is of course uh, admitting itself as fantasy, you know, there is no disguise about it. And th this kind of, uh, you know, playing with history, with alternative historical scenarios, did become really popular in post-Soviet Russia, mm. for uh, the reasons of which are, I think, quite clear. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'm green. I think that the, what, what Sonia just did, she produced a very beautiful analysis of this book, showing that it is a sort of, uh, as opposed to historiographical Metafiction in the Hutchins mm -hmm. uh, term, it is uh, metafictional historiography or alternative mm -hmm. historiography, right? Mm -hmm. So, so basically, it is the sort of meta alternative history, right? Um, and uh, I, I, th I think though that that we are sort of exaggerating the uh, local factors because certainly the main inspiration for uh, 
today's writers of alternative history is in, in, included is Philip Dick, uh, who wasn't living in post Soviet Man Russia. Man in the High Castle. Yeah. Man in the High Castle. But that's and many one of his. That's not exactly one of his. Yes. It is, exactly. but, but, but his other shorter texts that always play with what would happen if mm -hmm. they, 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 they prepared mm -hmm. to they this. Not, not what would happen. Okay, okay. okay. There, there are a number of texts. Yeah. Okay, I wouldn't say always there is a number of texts mm -hmm. that is playing with, with if um, mm -hmm. factor. Now he's the most legitimate face of alternate, of alternate history and contemporary science fiction because he did something with it besides Hitler wins. Um, but yeah, but yeah. Okay, but, but there is another influence, of course, it is in Bartek uh, mm -hmm. with his uh, Foucault pen, pen. Right, which, which is another very influential text which appeared exactly during the prehistoric period and was well read. Uh, better than, than uh, any other of his novels. So, so I wouldn't say that, that that's entirely a uh, Russian tendency. And another thing that, 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 that puzzles me here uh, is that um, when we talk about alternative history, um, and when we are looking, for example, and Sonia, of course, named many of them, Bukov, uh, Pietzuk, Sharov, um, none of these examples belongs to uh, sci-fi or even fantasy, That's because. right? Uh, and uh, in Pinev, we, we also are sort of in the borderline situation, right? Because um, I would say that that the only work that of alternative history proper is his generation where because he describes what happened behind the scenes of 1998 financial crisis, right? <laughs> while while uh, Chipayev, of course, what what, what kind of uh, history is he alternating? History as as we know it from uh, Chipayev's jokes. It's not history, of course. Right? Uh, or uh, if we are talking about, of course, Krustanimir, yes, I buy it. Right? But but that, that for some reason it's 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 his. It's not his uh, uh, major genre, so to speak, in my in my reading. So so I think that uh, what 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 Sonia is talking about is that. Uh, it is uh, that uh, alternative history is just a particular case of a much broader discourse, right, uh, of sort of alternative universe, of alternative reality, of alternative of parallel worlds, which which may or may not be historic, mm -hmm. right, and that's that that, mm -hmm. that suggests the sort of revisiting of the concept of this genre. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking that the last book. Uh, would also be a good example of alternative history because obviously Paul the first does, is not killed by the conspiracies, rather he invents the Elysium and you know departs it. But again, it's of course it's it's very alternative alternative history, not the way it's described, say in Dick or whoever we take as you know the model. The Nazis won, the Nazis did not lose. So, um, but a smart retail is probably a good example, right? Uh, no, yeah, yes and no, because because this uh, sort of alternation of history is just a framework for this idyllium uh, two-volume description, which, which has nothing to do with history at all, which is situated completely outside of any history, right? It's a historical by, 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 by definition. But we are beginning... Uh, right, so my job here is whenever the discussion gets interesting, I tell <laughs> you to stop. Um, so, so thank you for making me tell you to stop. Wrapping everything up rather than starting everything. There's a woman who needs no introduction, but I will give one anyway. Um, Elena Gashilo at OSU um, has written on about everything in every time period uh, gender, popular culture. Um, she, uh, some of her more recent books include Putin as celebrity and cultural icon, Embracing Arms, Cultural Representation of Slavic and Balkan Women in War, Fade from Red, The Cold War, and Ex-Enemy Russian-American Film, um, and Russian Aviation and Space Flight, Visual Culture, Co-Editing of Vlad Strukov. Um, also, she's looking at a monograph called Graphic Ideology, The Soviet Post from Stalin to Yeltsin, and two other volumes, Beauty Without Caps, Taboo, 
Nate Peters Verdon Academy of the Fine Arts with Mary Engstrom and Vlad Struka, and Hollywood Meets Polish Films with Beth Holmgren. So it's exhausting just really to name what she, to describe what she's working on. But Helena has promised a special treat for today. I have give, heard her give so many talks over the years, and she has promised to give a bad talk. So, um, so, so if, if this works, this is like a historic event. Yeah, um, it's an alternate, it's alternate. It's really sad. Oh, look at the nice radio, kind of rainbow thing. Exactly. It's the hypnotizer. It's to compensate. <laughs> what I was going to, no, what I was going to say is, whoever has been seeing it has the hottest ass in the world. I mean, really, I'm serious. It's steaming. Uh, it's a whole series of hot asses. <laughs> <laughs> that, that is how I describe fun. So, anyway, welcome. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I want to say that uh, I think that by now everyone's brain must be benumbed by fatigue, which is the ideal condition in which to hear this. Okay? So the title of my talk is Taxonomy and its Discontent and Content, or When is Sci-Fi Not Sci-Fi? As the title of this conference evidences, science fiction and fantasy are not synonymous. Indeed, the marriage is morganatic with many authors and fans of SF relegating fantasy to a lower class of, imagination, of imaginative fiction. Such a hierarchical attitude towards a genre that has gained a measure of respectability only in the last few decades nicely illustrates Pierre Bourdieu's notion of distinction as a vital cause, as a vital force in sociocultural judgments. Multiple internet sites, as well as some authors, have designated SF as prophetic and philosophical, I can feel Elliot flinching, <laughs> geared to sociological predictions and commentary. Not, not claims, I think, typically made of fantasists, though they do you know, sometimes say that of themselves. Rod Serling famously declared that SF is, and I quote, the improbable made possible, whereas fantasy is the impossible made probable. But what of the genre of science fantasy most re recently recognized in the West, which just so happens to literally equate to the Russian term naučnaya fantastika. As one commentator observed, science fantasy quotes with, quote, a scientific veneer of realia, phenomena that under no circumstances would happen in the real world and operate within the supernatural which hardcore SF accords. What complicates such distinctions inter alia is the double-edged tendency of science to change our understanding of what is possible, thereby defantasizing voyages to other planets, the scientific creation of life through cloning, more literally understood than what uh, was presented uh, today, and so forth. Furthermore, some SF writers have confessed themselves incapable of distinguishing between SF and fantasy. Attempts to differentiate over the years have adduced, however tentatively and certainly contentiously, the following. Number one, sci-fi tends to focus on the future, whereas fantasy likes to go to the past, which I think would have illustrated this conflict. B, sci-fi engages some basic, empirically verifiable scientific principles, whereas fantasy tends to bypass science in favor of utterly unapologetically fictitious beings and circumstances, sometimes past of this history. C, sci-fi often problematizes moral issues, whereas fantasy often, though not always, propounds a black versus white morality. These are not hard and fast criteria, but hard and fast criteria, excuse me, but characteristics of numerous instantiations of the two genres or modes, even with some examples are less clear cut. Definitions of SF quickly find themselves in quicksand. One of the most famous and influential is that by the Croatian uh, Darko Suvin, co founder with um, R.D. Mullen of the academic journal Science Fiction Studies, which was founded in 73, who, relying on Brecht, the formalist, and Ernst Bloch, called SF, and I quote him, a literature of cognitive estrangement, that was in 79, that introduces a novum which can encompass a range of innovations 
from an invention to setting or a relation unfamiliar to the reader's worldview. End of quote. In other words, the hypothetical new thing, Novum obviously from the Latin, at the center of an SF narrative, is imagined to exist by scientific means, not magic, and its validation by cognitive logic distinguishes it from fantasy. A glance at the 20 or so subgenres that most uh, sites list under SF, for example, steampunks, uh, space operas such as Star Wars and so on, suggest the possible inadequacy of Suvin's definition. And maybe that's particularly so after the milestone publication of William Gibson's cyberpunk, Necromancer, uh, significantly in 1984, which had a cool reception in Russia, interestingly enough. Those who approach SF rigorously likely would not include Ray Bradbury, for instance, as a writer of genuine SF. For his texts are no notoriously vague and pseudo-poetic in their descriptions of an imagined alien quote-unquote environment and its constituent features. As example, for <coughs> excuse me, for instance, in The Martian Chronicles. Apparently Mars, but hardly convincing as a place that owes its name of the Red Planet to the overlay of iron oxide on its surface. The collection's dystopian narratives may as well be the chronicles of Arkansas. <laughs> Bradbury has called SF, and I quote him, sociological studies of the future, things that the writer believes are going to happen by putting two and two together. He makes no mention, you notice, of science or technology, and his futuristic scenarios suggest that he shared Dostoevsky's idiosyncratic preferences in arithmetic. Mm -hmm. If, as Isaac Asimov has contended, sorry, Isaac Asimov has contended, American SF developed through three stages, from adventure to technology to sociology. In the last case, SF Tapoi chiefly functioned as metaphor, especially in utopias and dystopias, which, given the USSR's history, approximate big variations on lived experience. Hello, Yvonne. <laughs> Bradbury's vision of totalitarianism in the novel Fahrenheit 451 portrays a dystopian future society that lacks scientific elements. It is much closer to the political allegory of George Orwell's 1984 than, for example, to Philip Dick's sci-fi visions of the, of the future, such as Do Androids Dream of, uh, Dream of Electric Sheep, Adapt to the Screen as Ridley Scott's Blade Runner, and also his We Can Remember It For You wholesale, on which uh, Paul Verhoeven based the Arnold Schwarzenegger vehicle Total Recall. Like this, the text of <laughs> aren't they pretty? No. Uh, like this, the text of Stanislaw Lem and Asimov, with a precisely detailed scientific elaborations of phenomena, leave no doubt about the author's knowledge of and extrapolation from bona fide science, which, unlike Bradbury's narratives, fulfill the promise of one half of the genre's label. In 1981. Uh, Robert Heinlein declared, and I quote, science fiction is speculative fiction, in which the authors take as its first postulate, <coughs> excuse me, the real world as we know it, including all established facts and natural laws. The result can be extremely fantastic in content, but it is not fantasy. It is legitimate and often very tightly reasoned speculation about the possibilities of the real world. This category excludes rocket ships that make U-turns, serpent men of Neptune that lust after human maidens, <laughs> and stories by authors who flunked their Boy Scout badge tests in descriptive astronomy. <laughs> End of quote. Here Heinlein was echoing Asimov, who approximately 30 years earlier had called SF, and I quote, that branch of literature which is concerned with the impact of scientific advance upon human beings. Quote, end of quote. Later he amended his definition to that branch of literature which deals with the reaction of human beings to changes, but again, in science and technology. And in 1990, he offered a stricter, more refined version, now saying hard science fiction is stories that feature authentic scientific knowledge and depend upon it for plot uh, <clears throat> development and plot resolution. 
end of quote. By then, it had become customary to view the genre as falling in either, into either hard or soft SF. And it is specifically the latter that all too often overlaps with fantasy or seems indistinguishable from it. As in many other areas, I vote for hard. <laughs> so the Russian case. In Russia, so-called SF frequently semi-substituted for philosophy or political thinking. Particular visions of utopia and dystopia is illustrated by a wide, wide range of texts. Works that tradition has canonized, uh, has canonized SF encompass, <coughs> excuse me, Alexei and Tolstoy's a very talky elite of 23, right, with revolution on Mars, about which, uh, and indeed it has written with, um, I think, impressive eloquence. Uh, Yevgeny Zamyatin's Mlin, okay. uh, Bulgakov's uh, Sabache Sierce and Rakovie Yaitza, Alexander Bilyayev's Golova Professor Adoelia, and Chelvek Amphibia, Yefremov's obviously didactic and upbeat. Um, Tumanist uh, Andromedy. Okay, and then forgive me, as you can see, I am not a fan. The mercilessly prolific Boris and Arkadis Trudgatskis, Trudno uh, Bogum, and Picnic na Avoti. The similarly prolific uh, Kir Bulichov, um, his Alisa uh, Sileznyva's children series, Pestednia uh, Vaina, and Kanyets uh, Atlantide. More recent contributions to the genre reportedly include, I haven't read this, uh, Yulia Martinina's Insider. Has anyone read that? Okay. And Dmitry uh, Volkovsky's Metro uh, 2033. And then, of course, Metro of the following year and subsequent metros, as well as the cleverly titled Futu Tochka Ru. Okay. He looks like a bouncer, but um, <laughs> right rather differently, okay? <laughs> the writers and directors in the West, with the exception of Asimov and Roger Corman, have shown relatively little interest in Soviet and Russian SF. Kuchowski's Metro uh, 2033 is to be transferred to the Hollywood screen, apparently, by X-Men film series producer Michael DeLuca and Stephen Lehreux, producer of Sin City. Soviet screen adaptations typically followed and continue to follow many of the works I mentioned, which in my view hardly qualify as SF, but are indeed fantasy. And today, not SF, but fantasy floods Russia, and particularly Ukraine, notably by such authors as Marina and Sergei Dyachenko and Sergei Lukyanenko. I suppose I should have said um, Dyachenko. Um, Lukyanenko, especially in his Dazor series, um, you know, has, I think, very little to do with science fiction. Unlike uh, Anindita, who echoes Frederick Jameson, I do not believe that space is the defining uh, category in science fiction. For such a metric excludes, metric excludes both bona fide SF works, yet is receptive to fantasy. Um, I, by the way, I do not publish on science fiction, uh, and I'm not writing a book on it, an article, or anything of that nature, but I have taught it for 900 years. And um, you see that from an example of science fiction in front of you. <laughs> Whenever I teach an undergraduate survey as F, as S, survey of SF, <coughs> sorry, and I do always in a comparative vein, I organize the structure and concepts into two categories of what I call trespass against boundaries, or in Suvin's terms, four categories of uh, cognitive astranienia, temporal, spatial, biological, and ontological. Accordingly, we read or watch narratives of time travel in future worlds, of voyages to other planets or alien visitors from them, of scientific experiments that yield peculiar entities, whether half-human, half-animal creatures, or robot cyborgs and unclassifiable, unclassifiable beings, and also, of course, of virtual realities. The outstanding pioneer in the first three, of course, was H.G. Wells, and the most gifted contemporary author of SF, who has explored all these in a highly sophisticated 
uh, mode is in, not just in my view, but in Soviet um, audiences' view, uh, Stanislav Lem. As regards specifically Russian literature and film, contrary to Ivan and other colleagues, I frankly find few texts worth reading as sci-fi, as fantasy, that's something else. Um, but most of all, what disappoints me is films based on sci-fi. And to my view, the best marriage would be um, using um, Russian text and American uh, films. Surprisingly, during the early period of classical literature, um, it was sorry, during the early period, that would be the 1920s, it was classical literature rather than popular fiction that, in my view, created convincing SF worlds. I have in mind Zamyatin's Me, to which virtually all utopias and dystopias just add or subtract from, Bulgakov Sabachi Sierce, satirical products of the 1920s when Soviets genuinely experimented with society as well as biological rejuvenation. Okay. Also, that was the period that saw Fritz Lang's Metropolis of 26-27 and Frau im Mond, right, A Woman in the Moon, 1929, and Lucian Hubbard's Mysterious Island, based on Verne. Okay, all of these were really the films released then, and I think they're bona fide uh, science fiction. Um, Yakov uh, Pratazanov's On Screen Elite, the first Soviet uh, film, um, I think is infinitely more absorbing than Tolstoy's propagandistic diatribe. But for me, in all honesty, I find it worth watching much more for Alexander Exter's inventive costumes than for the narrative, which, in my view, overly adheres to the novel. If, as some sites claim, a uh, land borrowed from Pratazanov, I think he in some ways outstripped him in scientific and visual imagination. After the 1920s, it seems to me science in SF fell upon very hard times in Russia. As Yelena Gomel, who is at Tel Aviv University, points out, the influential Strugatsky brothers repeatedly insisted that, and I quote her, S have had to justify its existence by being literature. That is conforming to the aesthetic criteria of the, uh, of the mainstream. Excuse me. <clears throat> End of quote. The concept of literature as moral force, and I quote her, eventually led the brothers to neglect specific science, fictional narratives, um, and their strategies in favor of stylistic experimentation and obscure religious and mystical messages. In fact, she believes they bequeath to their disciples a contempt for SF. Consequently, part of Russian SF gradually merged with the literary mainstream, and this is what we have in Kievan, I think, while fantasy consolidated at the expense of hard science fiction. That is why if I were to answer the question posed by my title, when is sci-fi not sci-fi, somewhat but not altogether frivolously, frivolously, I'd say usually when it's Russian. <laughs> so meaning it's fantasy, it's not as if. Marriage of SF and film via technology. Okay. <coughs> um, as uh, Georges Méliès in his trip to the moon and the impossible voyage quickly recognized, film with its technologies is the ideal medium for SF. Sorry. <clears throat> Yet neither Soviet nor Russian cinema, in my view, has produced anything comparable in quality to Metropolis, Fantastic Voyage, Invasion of the Body Snatchers, Alien, Blade Runner, even Terminator, Dark City, or Predestination, came out in 2004. Regrettably, Soviet and today's Russians have not adapted several highly promising early homegrown SF narratives, which anticipated, anticipated impressively, I thought, American scenarios on page and screen. And especially, and this is what I learned from your collection, which I've read, okay? Um, for instance, the plot of Valery Brusev's, uh, is it Vastani Mashin? Is it Bunt Mashin? Well, there's mutation, there's Vastani. It there's is Vastani. Okay, thank you. Okay. Anyway, in 1908, no, in 1908, and I found this amazingly impressive, okay, in which a robot acquires a kind of mind of its own, okay, and seems to turn upon its uh, creators, would be taken up 
many, many, many years later in Asimov's popular iRobot. I adapted, uh, adapted into a film, <coughs> I'm sorry, <coughs> adapted into a film, oh, I seem to have lost some of my visuals, okay, by Alex Proyas and also James Cameron's blockbuster Terminator, plus its sequels. <coughs> that plot situation also fed, it seems to be, into the Sturgatsky brothers' spontaneous reflex, also included in Yvonne's uh, recent volume, no, volume Red Star Tales. Um, and I think it's amazing that the first time that this came out was in 1908, and I wish somebody would try to elaborate that into you know, some kind of film narrative. Okay, um, okay I'm going to drop some of these, um, some of what I have to say because it's uh, almost time. Um, I think Russian sci-fi, which in many ways exists in a kind of cultural ghetto internationally, okay, uh, would be rescued from that ghetto through quality film adaptations and scholarly comparative studies, now virtually non-existent. In the 1960s and 1970s, Collier Books, the paperback imprint of Macmillan, attempted to introduce Anglophone readers to Russian SF through collections of stories such as Soviet science fiction and more Soviet science fiction of 1962, with introductions by Asimov. That was more and more and more. No, I guess ultimately it will be more and more. I only have two volumes. So. The press actually devised a series titled Best of Soviet Science Fiction, which published works by Arkady and Boris Trugatsky, Dmitry Bilenkin, and Vladimir uh, Savchenko, okay? as well as a volume of short fiction by Bulichov called Half a Life, which again, this is, is this really sci-fi, contains a love story humorously titled, are you ready, Snigurichka, okay? No such efforts exist today. And I noticed that Yvonne and her colleagues had to launch a Kickstarter campaign to bring up their mythology, right? More than a decade ago, Alexander Levitsky from Brown University, after some time and considerable effort, managed to get Overlook Press to bring out his 2004 collection, Worlds Apart, an anthology of Russian fantasy and science fiction. And is there anyone who's ever used it in a sci-fi course? You have. Two of them. Wow. Excellent. Ah, excellent. Ah, excellent. Yeah, excellent. Yeah. Yes. Um, I have found it just simply unusable. <laughs> anyway, okay. What I find very dispiriting is that mammoth anthologies of over 1,000 pages, such as Heather Masri's Science Fiction Stories and Context that came out in 2009, it contains selections from Zamyatin, Chapek, and Lem, but otherwise, okay. It contains exclusively Anglophone SF. Another huge tome, the Prentice Hall Anthology of Science Fiction and Fantasy that came out in 2001, as well as the 600 plus page annual, mm -hmm. annual publication, The Year's Best in Science Fiction, St. Martin's Press, okay? <clears throat> and uh, the year 2000 saw the 17th volume of that, okay? they always confined themselves exclusively to American and British authors, with the exception of Gaston Jules Verne. Talk about living in the past, okay? Um, film helps to popularize SF. And Timur Birkman Pietov's Dazor series, with some mistake for sci-fi, certainly opened American doors to Lukianenko's prose for better and, let's face it, for worse. Uh, just as Tarkovsky's Starker, and more recently, <coughs> excuse me, uh, Germans through the Wittbogen acquired a broad public in the West um, with, sorry, acquired um, a kind of interaction in the West with the reading public and Stugatsky's fiction. But translation of individual works by half a dozen writers aside, for the most part, Soviet and Russian SF rarely penetrates the West. If the birth of Bukowski's debut novel on the internet sets a precedent, that mode of composition may improve the sorry, the very sorry international status of Russian fantasy masquerading as SF. Okay, now finally, uh, illustrations of SF for juveniles. Uh, though I find much of Soviet SF feeble, no, a genre where convincing looking Soviet SF thrived was children's and adolescents' publications including books and magazines, mm -hmm. above all the publication Technika Maladyoshe, 
established in 1933. In the interest of redemption, both of the genre and my presentation, I wish to end with some of those images. In 1965, uh, for instance, the film director Pavel uh, Kulshantsev, okay, whose the Daroga Xvyostam was a cinematic milestone, authored Stancia Ulna with eloquent illustrations. And just look at these. Aren't these impressive? Anyway, I think they're pretty good. Okay. Um, Andrei Sakharov and others likewise created original and persuasive images of other planets under the modified influence, which sometimes was so modified it was not visible, of constructivism. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Excuse me. I don't know, beautiful. Okay, and then there's a set of uh, Sokolov postcards. Okay. In fact, Sokolov, interestingly, collaborated with the cosmonaut Alexei Leonov, the first man to walk in space. And not only was he the first man to walk in space and was recognized okay, for his historic role, but he also, it turned out, was a fine amateur painter. This is his. Okay, impressive, I think. Um, <clears throat> Other artists demonstrated um, imagination and fine graphic techniques. This, for example, I find also okay, is uh, pretty impressive. Not only that, covers of Technika Maladyoje testify to illustrators' talent, okay, the talent of graphic artists in the USSR. Okay. Now, this testifies to the talent, also as well to some peculiarities of the human heart and heart. Isn't this quite something? Okay. <laughs> and this is technica maladjur, the technic of drop. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? I just don't get it. Okay. No. Um, um, at first, I know, I, I was doing this, I was very tired one evening, and I just thought I was missing something. <laughs> but it turned out that he's missing something, not I. <coughs> and as you can see already here, this is no longer, right? Soviet with you no know, elements of constructivism and so on, right? This has moved already into decorativeness. Okay. Um, never, I think... Um, Technica Maladyoje, which it turns out is archived in full, at least the magazine, you can actually get the images from it in full, came from the magazine's inception to the present day. And if you have any students who are very good at visuals and who are waiting for um, a topic for a dissertation, um, I suggest you direct them to this site. Okay? This is it, and I'm five minutes late. I'm sorry. That's it. <laughs> Okay. Well, thank you. Um, we, we don't have time, but we do have time. Um, so here's what's going on. I, I, I am so amazed that you have, have all survived being frog marched through an entire day of, um, of talks on Russian fantasy and science fiction, so we actually deserve applause for ourselves. Okay. Um, but what's going on now is the panelists uh, have a 6.30 <coughs> uh, dinner date. Um, and it is now 6.05. Um, so what I suggest is those of us who are, feel like first talking about Helena's talk and then really about anything, um, stay. But with the understanding that all panelists really have to go in about 10, 15 minutes. And anyone who feels like, you know, it's time to go, no one will hold it against you. So, um, but also while I'm speaking, while I have the floor, I do want to thank um, Heather for uh, yes. all the organizations. Anything for this conference that has the word organization without a dis in front of it uh -huh. is thanks to Heather. Uh -huh. And also, um, Ilaria and Natasha, I don't know if they're still, they survived, but they were, they're, oh, there's Ilaria, have been taking notes on this entire thing. 
um, to uh, put up a recap on the blog and also the, and also have been um, recording all of this for posterity. I... Yeah. <laughs> so, um, I'm sorry, what blog does this recap go to? Oh, um, all the Russians. Uh, I'm sorry, the, the, Jordan, the Jordan Center blog. Um, so thank you all for, 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 doing, for all the work you put into this. Um, and now, any questions or comments for Helena? Yes, Mark. Thank you so much for, <coughs> as usual, thought-provoking uh, talk. Um, of course, this, this is a uh, truism, but uh, speaking about the distinction between uh, sci-fi and fantasy, we all know this phrase from Arthur Clarke, any sufficient advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic, right? And uh, it's um, very much yeah. so in relation to uh, readers like me, for whom anything that is more complex than 3 plus 3 is magic. Uh, and uh, aren't we talking about just, just, just different, different conventions of uh, what Suvin calls novum or what Shklovsky calls estrangement? Uh, mm -hmm. One uh, packed as rationalistic justification, another as magic, supernatural, etc. But but we are dealing with the same genre, just, just differently pre-packed, right? And uh, uh, the distinction between all this uh, uh, fantasy and science fiction is that in one genre, so, so, so the, uh, each of genres has its own set of triggers, right? If we see gnomes and well, elves... Science fiction, marked by uh, definition, should have some science. No, no well, what I mean, it, it had science in 19th century. And in the 20th century, when science is, is, is very complex, it is incomprehensible, for, and it's not supposed to be comprehensible. When they tell me that it is some kind of laser blaster, I'm supposed to believe into it. I'm not supposed to analyze how it works, and I would never be able to do that. Oh. Right? So it is just, just a form of magic. Right? That's, that's my argument. Yeah. <laughs> Well, it is not. That's no, exactly. Well, yeah. yeah, that was exactly what I was saying. It is not magic. It should, and it should not be magic. You know, because then what happens is, I mean, there's absolutely there's no difference between. Okay. Um, first of all, let me say that science fiction, certainly Anglo-Saxon science fiction, makes no pretense to being literature. Sure, it does. No, it does not. It's, it's, not. Like, it's science fiction. Uh, it there's a lot of science fiction, fiction that does. It is science fiction. What about it, Frankenstein? And I think... <laughs> yes, but that's also yeah. problematic. Look, okay, whenever I ask in my science fiction class, what was the first science fiction uh, narrative? I get different responses. Some people say um, Mary Shelley's uh, Frankenstein. The really smart students say, well, it's hard to prove in terms of science, but I think it was the Garden of Eden. But see, Adam Roberts um, has this... Don't say Adam just because I said Yes, but Adam Roberts, <laughs> yes, but he, had, he named this well. Um, he, has in, he has two completely opposite approaches to science fiction in his two books. And, one of, and the one that I find more useful for our discussion is where he talks about what's called the science fiction megatext. And mm -hmm. what he's saying there is it's a variation on science fiction is what I point to when I call it science fiction. But the idea here is that um, for him, science fiction as a genre science fiction, as opposed mm -hmm. to people sort of dabbling in science fiction, is the set of books that exist in an ecosystem where the other books also exist. So, for instance, when you read Tolstoy's Kris, right, mm -hmm. um, there, she may, you could imagine that she's never read um, a post-apocalyptic novel, or not very many yeah, of them. and I don't think she has. And then she has, right. So it's not part of the science fiction megatext. It's, mm -hmm. it's author on its own, as often happens when literary writers dabble in science fiction. Margaret Atwood is a huge exception. Mm -hmm. She actually knows this other stuff. So there's the science fiction megatext, which I think op operates really well. And in terms of the distinction, there are two things that I find useful for fantasy versus science fiction. And one of them does, does actually um, necessitate throwing out things that people normally refer to as science fiction. But... For me, um, once you have a metaphysics, um, say, you know, true evil, true good, the force, all mm -hmm. of that, then you are not in the realm of, of, of a scientifically based universe, exactly. you're in the realm of a fantastic based universe, which includes Star Wars. 
Um, just the fact of robots Star and spaceships. Is a soap opera. Yeah, space. I mean, uh, space opera, but the sorry. fact of but the fact of robots and spaceships give you the trappings of science fiction. But mm -hmm. the basic ethos here um, is fantasy. Then yeah. Samuel R. Delaney mm -hmm. has this wonderful set of distinctions in which he defines science fiction on the sentence level, um, where he talks about yeah, uh, where he talks about um, a certain type of, uh, of mood, um, and that, that science fiction is what hasn't happened but could happen. Mm -hmm. um, alter, altered history is what didn't happen but could have happened. Fantasy is what didn't happen and, and can't happen and won't happen. Mm -hmm. um, and he points out on the sentence level, this, what I love about this example is how his, his, um, his, ex, his example is almost out of date. Um, the se one sentence he gives is, the door dilated. Um, and at, when he writes this in the 1960s, then he says that sentence tells us we are in a science fictional environment by the fact of, of what is being described here. In the 1960s, also the door opened by itself could have, mm -hmm. could have done the same thing. It also could be written by somebody who doesn't know English well. True, yes, but that was not Samuel R. Delaney. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I, 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 understand, I think the policing of these genres is always problematic, but the collapsing of them is even more problematic. And what, but one of the things that makes us problematic is usually when you are defending the distinction between science fiction and fantasy, it's most often defending science fiction against fantasy, which gets all of the crap that science fiction gets displaced onto fantasy as the better mm -hmm. genre. Yes. No. Well, but I think that's because there is what I call soft sci-fi. I think it does move to fantasy. This, for me, is what a Ray Bradbury is. How about Ursula Le Guin? No. Well, she, for me, is border. Mm -hmm. She's anthropologically. She's anthropologically, yeah. right, because yeah. the extrapolation going on here for Ursula yeah. Le Guin is extrapolating, and this is where Asimov's thing gets, gets wonky, is extrapolating from anthropology mm -hmm. um, and sociology. And, and yes, yeah, she has at the, once then goes in right. back. And she mm -hmm. has the ansible, but that's just a, a way to, get mm -hmm. a, to solve a problem. Mm -hmm. um, what she's really interested in is, is, is human structures that need some sort of mm -hmm. other setting, mm -hmm. but one that isn't based on um, total fantasy. Mm -hmm. yeah, um, yeah, so I have a comment rather than a question. Um, Mark brought up um, Clark's Law, which I feel that comes up in every panel I ever end up on in a science fiction conference about like magic and religion and science fiction and things like that, um, about how any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. And so once you say that, um, drawing the line between sci-fi and fantasy obviously becomes really hard because it's just a spectrum. Um, so I wanted to bring up David Brin, who um, for him, sort of it doesn't really matter whether you have magic or whether you have science precisely because, you know, science is magic from another perspective. For him, science fiction is inherently sort of progressive and fantasy is inherently conservative. The mm -hmm. status quo is preserved. So I just wanted to, this, this is not really a question, this is more of a comment, but I wanted to um, suggest that since we're sort of debating mm -hmm. the lines between science fiction and fantasy. Well, that was exactly what I had in the three points, in the three distinctions, okay, is indeed that science fiction projects into the future on the basis of specific things in the present, specific things usually convincingly rendered, whereas Fantasy just likes to go to the past. That's epic fantasy. No, not just epic fantasy. No, what about urban fantasy? There, there are all of these subgenres. The, the, the first thing we think of with epic fantasy is you know, unicorns and dragons and castles, mm -hmm. um, and the whole medieval setting. So and even that can be subverted to be to be uh, subverted to be less conservative. The default <coughs> mode is absolutely conservative. <coughs> but oh, gosh, we have, have, we have to have our kings and queens and all of that. But there are loads of ways of doing fantasy, mm -hmm. particularly involving mm -hmm. magical creatures. Um, you know, so you, no, because you have Mendelssohn's immersive, we're talking about immersive fantasy versus intrusive fantasy versus... Um, I'm sorry, Elle, but as soon as you see magical creatures, that at once, as far as I'm concerned, takes us into the other camp. It's oh, fantasy, yeah. but it doesn't have to be conser it doesn't have to be conservative and, and regressive. It's, it's, also, it's, it's, it's not impossible that no, tomorrow we have these creatures around I us. Just like okay, okay, the most magical thing ever is like my GPS. You know, yeah. <laughs> you, know, yeah. you, know yeah. you must have a lot better GPS. <laughs> than yeah. 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 The, GPS, <laughs> the GPS is scientific. It only seems magical. I know. Magical yeah, but if you look into the Middle Ages, they would be like magic. I'm just not sure these decisions. Uh, we have Monty already created that lights in the dark. It's it's with the fish or something, gene monkey that 
have uh, lights in the dark. So, so is it magic or it's science? It's science. Yeah, but basically I think the issue is that, well, again, any science can look like magic if you look at it from the right perspective. That perspective would just have to be, you know, several hundred years removed. Like with the GPS, you would have to be looking at it in the Middle Ages. Which well, today, as far as it Well, yeah, I mean, how many people know how a GPS uh -huh. actually mm. works and the fact that it uses relativity? But someone does. Spinning. <laughs> yeah, people do. Yeah, well, that doesn't matter. Go to the magic shiny <laughs> box and you know, see where to go with the female <laughs> voice. Dina's magic. been waiting for quite a while. Uh, yeah, I just wonder how would you, re you know, position yourself in relation to this discussion which took place a couple of years ago in their new literary history, uh, this journal there, Hayden White and Thomas Pavel debated precisely this question about the emergence of the genres. And uh, Pavel advocated this essentialist approach to the idea of the genre, while Hayden White responded to him about, in a more kind of trying basically to, you know, rebuff both uh, uh, essentialist and uh, uh, kind of Bakhtinian or uh, anti-essentialist approach. So I wonder what you think about Hayden White's historical proposition. Well, I'd have, I'd have to read it in order to say anything about well, he basically, it. He well, wait, no, this is your rendition of it. Let me just say one thing. As I said, science develops in such a way that what seems impossible at some time okay, becomes possible. So that alters our sense right, of possible and probable. So of course, it's dynamic. Well, I just wanted to, since we are all quoting other people, um, <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to throw Ishan yeah. into the mix, which I did several times at this conference. So his kind of <coughs> definition of the distinction is that science fiction is everything that originates from the capacities of human cognition. In other words, it doesn't have to be something that is real and here and now, but like how far our brain, like how, how far our brains can imagine ourselves and sometimes tries to imagine the other, yeah, including bats and, or, no, and monkeys. Fantasy begins where that capacity ends, which does not mean that there is not one or two or three works of science fiction that actually start from beyond the limits of human cognition, and Solaris is one, actually, that challenges that boundary, but they are very few and far between those kinds of science fiction things. So that's, I like that definition a lot, so that's my two cents. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm sorry to throw this into the wrong direction, uh, but and let me sort of uh, just uh, what what I suggested. I, I think I think that the wrong direction is that that we are trying to define genres from outside of cultural realm, and that that shouldn't be done, right? Uh, and uh, that's why we're talking about limits of cognition. And uh, I, I really don't understand why imagining oneself a unicorn is not within my limits of cognition. I can't, uh, right? Uh, it's quite possible. So I, I so and if if we. <laughs> Just unicorn, I, I must say. <laughs> yes, uh, but so if we get back to to cultural realm, then we have to say that here we are dealing with two discursive traditions, right? One that is posing as rationalist, and another is posing as irrational, right? Or supernatural, religious, or metaphysical, whatever. But, but this are just uh, the 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 the. the system or whatever, uh, chains of signifiers. And we have to treat it, treat them as, as such, and not to talk about science, whether it's scientific mm -hmm. or not. Mm -hmm. right? We are having this rationalist tradition, we may argue whether it's coming from actual science or from utopian thing. It's, it's a big question, right? And we may also argue that the fantasy discursive lineage comes back to fairy tales, to certain uh, mythologies, legends, etc., etc. That, 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 that is what we are dealing with, and, and we, we, we need to distinguish them remaining within this, this framework and not going into science or not science in, in, into our brain powers or lack of them. But Mark, you just 
uh, very imaginatively presented Professor Des Heidenwald's point of view about the historical origins of the genre. He says that there is no essence in the genres and cannot be, but they still define them. They still kind of make the difference between them. So it's only the history which makes their things really different. And it's only by history of this particular genre as we can define it. Well, like so, so many other things, I mean, you kind of, the, 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 they're in the middle of the group. You kind of know where you see it. And around all the blurry boundaries, it's very, it's probably impossible to find it. I don't think it really actually matters very much. Um, especially contemporary stuff, it's science fiction seems to be slowly creeping and like you can start to call everything yeah. back. Mm -hmm. No, I, 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 I think that's why I said that's why yeah. it's such a yeah. dynamic thing that right now you have subgenres, then you have subgenres within subgenres. So I'm yeah. gonna I'm gonna give the last word to Jacob, who's been waiting, oh. um, <laughs> and, and then we're all shutting up. Uh, <laughs> Uh, it's a, a great deal of pressure on the last comment all of a sudden, but uh, right. uh, everybody's been disagreeing with each other, so I want to try to agree with everybody, kind of, as a, as a last this just, gesture of this inclusiveness. Will be real this, is my, this is fantasy. <laughs> and it, 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 it seems to me that uh, it's, the, it's these kinds of rhetorical postures, that's precisely what allows us to distinguish one genre from, from the other, right? Like, I don't think they were ever going to identify a single object or a single theme and be able to distinguish on the basis of the content or the object represented what genre it belongs to. You can say, oh, it's a thing that flies, but it could be, it, it could be uh, a science fiction object or, or it could be a, a fantasy object, depending on what kind of world has been constructed there. It seems to me that, that science fiction um, has a special relationship with utopia mm -hmm. and that um, the, the, the condition of science fiction is a kind of condition of possibility or, or a condition of realization. And when you're talking about the limit of cognition, um, you're, you're, you're actually thinking about something like um, utopia and the limits of the way that human beings can imagine their own behavior being realized historically. Right? And when you're talking about fantasy, you're often talking um, conversely about something that has a special relationship to um, creating you know, isolated alternate worlds uh, which reflect only the, the, the good parts or like a specific ideology from what comes uh, in, in, in the world in which you live. And, uh, and that, that genre is actually defined precisely by its, by its impossibility. And those, those two stances, it seems to me, might, might provide a kind of better borderline between the two genres than uh, kind of itemizing the, the sorts of technologies and behaviors that can belong in one world but not in the other. Okay. <laughs> thank you for so thank you, everybody. Thanks to all the panelists. Um, panelists, we are going to Aroma, which is on East 4th Street. Um, I can leave people there. It's very close. Um, but panelists and, and, um, and guests and everybody, um, thank you for your fortitude. And I'm sure we'll all be talking about all of this. Can um, we go to more. the hotel first? I